This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation with James O'Brien. Oh, three minutes after ten is the time. A very good morning to you. And um, and a, a quick heads up that the first hour of today's programme is very much in the deep. And it's a it's it's a strange topic. I, I know that I sometimes seem a little bit obsessive about debating issues and and the things the debates that define our age. I don't think it's unnatural for someone who does this for a living and someone who loved debating as a as a schoolboy to be uh, uh, fascinated by the dif- debates that define our age and the debates that you think are over sometimes and then and then they come back again. For for example, abortion. I thought that abortion. As a debate, as a moral debate, a social debate, I thought it was more or less done and dusted. I really did. Ten years ago, probably, I'd have thought, no. And and yet, ten years prior, to, or 30 years ago, it was a huge issue. It was one of the most common phone-in topics, stroke debating topics in, in the country. The death penalty has kind of disappeared. Possibly, I guess, because... The, of the Atlantic Ocean uh, and, and, and the distance between it being a thing in this country and it not being a thing. But they used, that used to be a hardy perennial of ethical debate, the, the death penalty. And the reason that I'm mentioning this is because there is a danger of a seeing, well, not even a danger, there is an inevitability, isn't there, of seeing assisted dying in the same space if if you do what i do for a living or indeed if you tune in to this kind of radio on a regular basis or if you do what i do and not for a living but as a, as a kind of area of interest and you find the evolution of ethical debate in the context of a single society absolutely fascinating and and i do but today I want to I want to try, if I can, to steer clear of that. I, I want to try, if I can, to take a to take a step back from the uh, the, the traditional debate and look instead at the the bigger impact. Because the traditional debate boils down to two or three things, and and one of them is is a form. And I use this phrase very cautiously. But I'm, I'm going to use it because I think it does the job better than any other phrase I can think of. It, it, it sometimes descends into a game of anecdote tennis. And by that, all I mean is that there will be a tale of heartbreaking suffering, mercifully curtailed, either actually or potentially, by assisted dying. And then there will be another tale of somebody living a fulfilling and generous life with a life-limiting condition with with a terminal illness living out their final days in in a, in a space of beauty even if they have been reduced in ways similar to the ones we just described as as unbearable suffering so so that doesn't i'm afraid answer the big ethical question this is what societies have to do this is what civilized societies have to do they have to work out who and what they want to be and that is what in a way we're charging parliament with doing at the moment as mps begin a debate on a new assisted dying law it is it falls to kim ledbetter um who's a lovely woman a really really impressive woman and and a great mp to introduce a bill giving choice at the end of life. We know that Sir Keir Starmer has promised to give it time to become law if the House of Commons passes it. The other danger you have, as I'm looking at the reasons why it is such a a, 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 a tricky debate, I want to say popular, but if I'd said popular, you'd know what I mean, is the very predictable and very easy contributions to it you you know the idea that you have um the danger of people being coerced into it that doesn't actually address the ethics of it do you see what i mean the fundamental question of whether a society should offer death to its citizens as an option provided by society you don't address that question by pointing out that some people might abuse the right some people may be abused 
as a consequence of the existence of the right. That's not what ethics is, is it? That's not that's not what philosophy does. Uh, well, of course it does sometimes, but not the fundamental questions. The absolute crux of the matter is not affected by extraneous detail. It's not affected by conflicting experiences that's better sorry let's say experience tennis or experience conflict conflicting experiences do not address the fundamental social and ethical question of whether or not society should offer people the chance to die before their time okay so you've got you've got the the, the details the, the 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 quibbles you've got the experiences you've got the stories but what you haven't got is is an actual ethical oh and then you've got religion religion is in a way the third problem because i find justin welby a really impressive man in fact both kim ledbetter and justin welby have been guests on full disclosure my my long form interview podcast that um man has managed over the last four or five years to reach almost every corner of public discourse from from uh, showbiz legends right through to fascinating figures like like justin welby and and indeed like kim who took up that seat in batley and spen after her sister joe cox was uh, assassinated uh, and I find Welby really thoughtful and impressive. I think thoughtful people are, are important, you know? I, and it doesn't mean they're right. It just means they're important. Gavin Williamson, I think, who has never been described as thoughtful by anybody, even his own mum, is calling at the moment for the Anglican bishops to be removed from the House of Lords. I can see some sense in his arguments because it depends on who the bishops are. And, and you don't want to say, let's abolish all the bishops because that one's an idiot, or let's keep all the bishops because that one's a genius. But I find Welby's contribution to this conversation, I find it fascinating. But you can't base your opinion on this, on your on society can't base its opinion on your faith, because there is no such thing as a universal faith, despite the best efforts of some characters in Tudor times. It's not a thing, or Oliver Cromwell, I suppose. It's not a thing. There is no universal faith. And if a society says that there is, then the person at the top of that society is lying. So you can't get an answer to the ethical question of what, a, what it does to a society to offer the opportunity of assisted death. What does it do? What might it do? What will it do? And, and that is where you get the answer to the question of whether or not a society should... Do it. And that, that is why today I want to try, if we can, to step a bit further back on this. And part of the reason for it, really oddly, is because the, uh, the, the enduring mystery of why my former profession and, and elements of my current profession remain absolutely hypnotised by the fact that Keir Starmer went to a pop concert and subsequently met the, the, the star who'd been a target of a massive terror threat in another country and therefore um, sought a police escort when she was here. Do you know my mate Chris Moyles once had a police escort when he was doing the Radio 1 Roadshow? He, he got a police escort out of town. But hey-ho, I, I, I was looking into whether or not there was any precedent whatsoever for this absolute non-story being turned into an absolutely huge story. And I, I came across... Uh, something that I didn't know about. It was it was the Pall Mall Gazette in 1885, would you believe? And the story involved uh, a, a campaign against child prostitution. And the editor of the Pall Mall Gazette arranged to buy a 13-year-old girl. 1885. Arranged to buy a 13-year-old girl. And, and this was an epochal story. It was a story that changed the way society felt or changed the way society addressed an issue in in this case the proliferation of of child prostitution and, and and child brothels and i don't know why that sort of popped into my mind when i was looking at the assisted dying story i don't know exactly why but i think i've got an inkling i think it's because these moments ambush you we might have talked about assisted dying for for, for decades but these moments ambush you. These moments of, of profound and semi-permanent social change. I say semi-permanent because of what I said about the death penalty and abortion 10 minutes ago. They can ambush you. 
you suddenly find yourself living in a country where there is a death penalty or where it is impossible to get an abortion. You suddenly find yourself living in a country where you can kill 50 people and not lose your own life. You suddenly find yourself living in a country where you can terminate a pregnancy as easily as you can buy a packet of Rolos. Uh, these are extremes to, to, to prove my point. And that's where I think we are today. A judge and two doctors will have to agree that terminally ill patients can be helped to end their lives. So you introduce immediately the notion of state-sanctioned killing. Because who, who is going to provide the assistance, whether it is in, in that moment, whether it involves physical agency or whether it simply involves providing the means by which somebody can do it for themselves. You are essentially opening the door to state-sanctioned killing. And I think that is something that merits a conversation that manages somehow to avoid experience conflict as in contradicting experiences just you know we, we both sit in different corners of the room telling our stories and 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 expect one to prevail it has to avoid religion in the sense that your faith or your belief doesn't really give you the right to tell that person there who doesn't share your belief what you think they should do or how you think how you think they should live and 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 instead addresses the question of what it would do to a society and whether or not that is something that we would be comfortable with. If you hit the numbers now, you will get through. 0345 606973. So, and, and the other point, of course, is the, the safeguards and the details, which everybody is always at great pains. It turns into a different form of contradiction tennis, doesn't it? Somebody says, you, 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 you can't do this because you won't be able to safeguard people from exploitation or abuses. And then somebody else says, no, 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 you can do this because you will be able to safeguard people from exploitation and abuses. It may be that I'm being a bit naive thinking that that shouldn't be part of your pontifications. But, but comparing experiences in the hope of an objective answer is unhelpful. Comparing different opinions on details like regulations and protections is unhelpful and religion is unhelpful in this context because we're talking about people who don't believe what you believe is the hippocratic oath helpful first do no harm so that goes out the window doesn't it or does it first do no harm and yet you need two gps to say yeah we'll help you die what will it do what might it do what does it do to a population, to a society. What do you think will change if you know that this door is unlocked? For you. And it might, and this is where I think I, I fall into trap two of, of letting the details interfere with the ethics. I, I mean, it starts off with terminally ill patients, but it doesn't end there, does it? What about permanently paralysed patients what, what, who can currently, of course, go to Dignitas in Switzerland? What about people who just have had enough and, and want help in shuffling off this mortal coil? I, I really, and, and I know thin end of the wedge is a classic example of what I was describing in problem two, the, the, the conflict of detail. But for me, that is part of the question of what it might do to a society. If you hit the numbers now, you will get through. It's 10.16, and I want to know what you think it will feel like to wake up in a country where the state can help you die. 0345 6060 973. James O'Brien on LBC. 30 minutes after 10. I haven't offered a view on whether it's right or wrong, whether I, whether I approve or disapprove, because I, partly because I think that to answer that question, you need to have a slightly clearer picture of what it might do, what it is likely to do to a society to introduce the reality of state-assisted dying. State-assisted dying. It's not just assisted dying. It, it is the, gov the government essentially green lights it. Alex is in Nottingham. Alex, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Nice Hello. to speak to you. Um, well. Nice to speak to you. I'd just like to say I, I have a very strong opinion of this, and I always have. I feel it's very much an individual's choice 
about whether they want to end their life, um, much as it is a choice for someone to um, have an abortion. Um, you know, it, it very much impacts um, on quality of life. Mm. And I, I think it would be wrong for me or you or anybody else to force someone to live in an existence that they don't wish to, to carry on with. And I think um, with regards to society um, and the impacts, I think it could actually help us have a better relationship with death. I think particularly in this country, we're so very fearful of it and avoidant of it. Yeah. But it's something that's going to come to all of us. And I think we do need to make our peace with it better than, than we already do. So you're, 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 I think, suggesting that a squeamishness might confuse the conversation slightly. A squeamishness about that. And I'm using myself as a case study here, not, not, not suggesting you're generalizing about anyone else is is because we're not comfortable contemplating or talking about death per se this conversation can sometimes be a little bit overcautious yeah i think so and and i would say i i myself am very squeamish i don't think that i would necessarily make the the choice um it's very much dependent on the specific circumstance but yeah. i i have a a great fear of death and i but at the same time i know i have relatives that have specifically said to me, you know, if I'm in this situation, I do not want to be around. And the idea that my fear would stop them from doing something that they wish, I, I don't think is is fair. And But what it yeah, does, means- and, and I, this is why I'm not completely on board with the comparison with abortion, because abortion it, it hinges upon a different concept of what life is, doesn't it? To, to, to support abortion, you have to believe that human life begins at birth as opposed to conception so what the assisted dying does is and and i know i've said we have to leave religion out of it but i'm going to use the word sanctity it does it not diminish or even demolish the sanctity of life the idea that life is something that must be protected above all else even Um, if the even if the individual or the current specific possessor of that life doesn't want it protected i i mean just while it's in my head and before you answer it's i finally understood at the age of today years old why the church was always so passionately opposed to suicide why why suicide was always sinful in the eyes of the church but because it undermines a lot of religious teaching which is not an argument against it by all means uh, you know undermine religious teachings but even Irreligious people have some grasp of sanctity when it comes to human life or specialness, precious, preciousness perhaps is a better word. Does it not diminish I, the preciousness of life? No, I, I think quite the opposite, actually, because to, to really value life, I think we, we think about the quality as well as the quantity. Um, mm. You know, there's a difference between life and existence. Um, and I think to, to really honour life is also to honour you know, a person and their consciousness and therefore their choice um, of what to do with that life. Um, so I, I think, you know, if you honour someone's life, you honour who they are as a person, then you honour their choice of when to, when they feel their time is enough. Yes, I, I, I think I don't have any counters to your arguments, but given that this is a, a curious melange of intellectual and emotional uh, conversation not yours yours has been largely intellectual but I, it, it's not going to shift my emotional compass in the first instance from this fear if you like or discomfort about the idea of diminishment but you're right you, you, you give right, do you give more preciousness to life by making it easier to end it because of that relationship which alex has described rather beautifully between autonomy and existence Uh, What is existence without autonomy? What is existence without freedom? What is the ultimate freedom? The freedom to end your life. Crikey. Thank you, Alex. Kelly's in Brentwood. Kelly, what would you like to say? Hi. So um, I've been in the health profession for a a good few years. (laughs) um, And I actually work with early pregnancy now. So I see the kind of abortion side of it. And obviously, um, sort of terminal ill patients. And I think... Over the years of watching people dying and suffering, and last year I lost my mum to cancer, um, and she really did suffer, and it wasn't nice to watch. Um, I kind of feel like sometimes you are kind of pumping people full of drugs to prolong and drag it out. And and that's why I think, yeah, and that's why I think you can swerve 
the accusation of, 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 of focusing too much on the detail uh, yeah. as opposed to the ethics because the world has changed. The, the world is now a place where people who would have been dead 100 years ago with yeah. their current disease or their current condition are kept alive by medical yeah. intervention, whether they're terminally ill or not. And that means that the moral question perhaps has changed. It does kind of open the floodgates. I, I think you start somewhere and then yeah, there's well, that's the worry. other people saying, you know, we would like to do this, we would like to do that. But What about, can I ask you a slightly odd question? Yeah. If, if you were in the canteen at work mm -hmm. and this law was introduced and the conversation began, who's going to work on this? Who's going to go on the, the ward where we help people die? Would you put your hand up? Um, it's a really, really hard one because, like I say, I've been in a room where obviously my mum was pumped full of drugs and mm. I sometimes wonder, is it the actual medication that ends up killing people in the end rather than the illness? Because yeah. my mum was in pain for years. I think comes a point where you can't really separate the two, I suppose. No, because there? I mean, especially you're with watching chemotherapy. someone, yeah, you're watching someone die and it's like, you can see when someone's in pain whether they can't they can't actually register in the end because yes. they're not on this planet. Um, so, are we actually doing it anyway? And and would I, I don't know if I would feel comfortable or uncomfortable. I don't no. really know. That's why I said it was a, a strange question. What about I, I what about well, if what about if a colleague was really keen? <laughs> I find that a bit weird. <laughs> <laughs> but then I think, you know, how would you feel? I mean, I mean, if my dad, I mean, my, I know my dad said he'd never want to suffer like my mum did yeah, and let course. me go before, but he's always talking about dementia. And I think that's a really hard one because you can't give consent at that point, but you know that you wouldn't want to be like that. And someone uh, else is making a decision on your quality of life anyway. I mean, yeah. well, you brought palliative care into the conversation, but yeah. dementia care... Is, is different. Uh, I, what, what about the evolutionary argument that the reason why the species has survived this long is because we cling desperately onto life, what, what, almost whatever the circumstances. It's why suicide is so not just morally anomalous, but it's it's socially anomalous as well. It's it's taboo for a reason. It's because as a species, that inexplicable drive to be alive is yeah, what has seen us survive. Which, yes, that's why we're still what here. Do when you know you're diagnosed with cancer, yes, and exactly. you think I'm going to fight this, and then at the end, it's like, no, actually, can you just flip a switch, please? Because it's a ride uh, yeah. that you really want to get off. So. And you reach that moment. I, I, oh, dear. And I it's, don't know how I would feel as, uh, say, my daughter or my son was unwell and they wanted to go and I totally disagreed. Like, how would you feel as, as a, you know... As a parent. parent I would, I, well, as, a, as a parent or a child. Member, knowing anyone, that they're taking your child in a room to, to kill them. Well, there's so much there. Isn't it's, it's, yeah, it's too much. <laughs> well, I don't think you and I would be volunteering at, 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 um, <laughs> no. on, on day one. Kelly, but you, you're already doing um, the work of the angels, so uh, you get a free pass on that. The rest of us have to wrestle with with the with the ethics of it. I, I, I mean, just we managed to raise a smile there, Kelly and I, because it's tricky territory. But this might make you smile as well. I was just trying to find the story of the Pall Mall Gazette in 1885 when an editor called uh, W. T. Stead. Uh, completely shook up the entire country uh, by revealing that Keir Starmer had once met. Taylor Swift for 30... Oh, no, sorry, that's a different, enormous story. Uh, he completely shook up the country by revealing that he'd arranged to buy a 13-year-old girl, the daughter of a chimney sweep. And um, it led to a passing of the Criminal Law Amendment Act. It changed everything. I was just trying to find that story so I could share the details with you. The, the, the young girl was called Eliza Armstrong, for example. But because I wrote scoops into the uh, into the search engine. My screen just filled up with pictures of ice cream while I was talking to Kelly, which was somewhat distracting, to say the least. It's coming up to half past ten. You are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Sick could end life if doctors and judge agree. Would you want to be the judge? Would you want to be the doctor? And who would want to be the person responsible for administering the, 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 the coup de grace, the final countdown the, the, the injection or whatever it would be I, I don't know but these are areas that need to be properly considered if we're going to address the ethical question of what this quotes freedom end quotes would do to a society 
Half past ten is the time. Thomas Watts is here now with your headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. It is 10.33 and you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. I, I was... I, there was two stories bouncing around in my head this morning. The, the first I've shared with you about that child um, prostitution scoop, for want of a better word, when, when a single journalist changed the entire country on a, on a, a bizarrely, on an ethical or moral issue, in this case, um, by arranging to buy a 13-year-old girl in order to prove what the reality of a situation was. And, and the other was a moment in my own life when... I was sitting in the green room on one of those... I used to be a bit rude about these shows, which is a bit childish of me. Well, I, I used to really enjoy doing them, and they serve a great purpose. It's just, it's just not really for me anymore. Uh, on the debate shows, on the, on the telly, on a Sunday morning, you know, um, the, the big questions, I think, was the one I was doing at the time with the inimitable Nikki Campbell. And there was a woman there called Debbie Purdy, who was one of the earliest campaigners, one of the earliest crusaders for assisted dying because as soon as she was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis she started thinking in ways that our first caller would probably approve of because she started thinking very unsqueamishly about what her options would be and what her um uh, reality would be and she'd heard me banging on from a very religious point of view I, I used to come at this from the point of religion i used to come at the question of assisted dying from the point of the sanctity of life if I tell you that as a schoolboy, I, I, I used to be on the other side of the abortion debate, you'll get an idea of the influence that a Catholic education, a Catholic upbringing can have on you. And she, she wanted, she really wanted to talk to me. And she, I remember she came across the room in her wheelchair and said, I really want to talk to you about this because I understand where you're coming from and I want to tell you why you're wrong. And it was one of those amazing moments in your life where you begin to feel your certainties shift you begin to feel the ground beneath your feet give way because i could not sit there and tell her that she did not have a right to assisted dying i couldn't do it um and in many ways i still can't but that doesn't mean it's the right thing for an entire society to do or, or to facilitate or to bring in Ten thirty-five is the time no i did not know that sean W.T. Stead, the journalist that I keep talking about in reference to that amazing story in his Pall Mall Gazette in 1885. Did you know, James, says Sean, and I have not checked this, so I hope you're not yanking my chain, that W.T. Stead died on the Titanic. We're covering a lot of ground today. Bethan is in Paris, in, in, uh, in Wales. Bethan, what would you like to say? What made you pick up the phone? Hi, James. Hello. Um, so, I mean, I think the point you're just making about sanctity of life really sums up my point of view, which is, is the sanctity of life about the length of the life or the quality of the life? And it's about the existence of the life. Right, okay. So, but would that also come under the length of the life? No. Okay. It was about, I mean, if you think of it as a spark... Mm. It's either that... And, that, you know, that's not... That goes back to the ancients, doesn't it? The, 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 it's either there or it's not there. So it's. it's, mm -hmm. it's I don't think it is... A, a tension between quality and length. Okay, I, I I will leave that one then. But I suppose you my... don't have to. You're more than welcome to tell okay. me that I'm talking gibberish. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, my my heart is beating too fast for me to be uh, okay. too erudite on that point. But Fair enough. I I particularly I particularly feel that we each have um, the right to choose yeah. our our path in life, and that. The, the ability to choose the end that we want for ourselves and for our family to view, sort of listening to your previous caller who watched her mum struggle. Yes. Um, I, I feel like that having that option removes the fear of death for a lot of us. Is it, is and that, it, that would also... Go on. I, I, I feel that that would also allow us to live longer with more freedom. We'd be a bit less Victorian about everything. We'd be a little bit less squeamish because it, the, the conversation becomes part of our public discourse. It, it becomes part of our, I mean, certainly at the moment of diagnosis, as the example I just mentioned, Debbie Purdy, she, she was mm. built in such a way that made it something that she was both keen and perfectly capable of thinking very deeply about and campaigning. But for a lot of us, I forget what I was listening to earlier today when, when somebody talked about how we, we push 
Oh, I think it was in Oedipus last night. I saw Oedipus last night at the Wyndham's Theatre, one of the best things I've ever seen on the London stage. And, and he was, I can't remember the exact context of the soliloquy, but he was talking about how we don't want to know sometimes the bad stuff. We get a bad diagnosis. We don't want to know. Ignorance is bliss, that idea. With death, that's not true. The more you know and the more you think about it, the less traumatic and the less profound it will be when, when the moment finally comes. So all of these conversations are, 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 are helpful. But... And this is where I don't know whether I'm barking up the wrong tree, Beth. And I understand all of the arguments about individual choice. And I understand that the state or the, 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 the population or the civilization or the country or whatever you want to call it. I understand that that is a human construct, or at least it's constructed of and by humans. But does it, is it also a thing that has a relationship with death, with assisting death? So snuffing out that spark is something that in this society we don't currently deliberately do and we would become a society that did i it's very difficult for me for for me to be just passionate about it because yes. i believe so so very strongly I, I can't be unbiased that i i don't see any more dignity in making somebody board a plane at an earlier point in their life than they would otherwise do to choose this for themselves. Yeah. Because it, they it, don't it, want it to get their cruel. loved ones prosecuted. It feels like cruelty. It does to me. It, it doesn't it does feel it doesn't feel like the spirit of the do no harm part of the Hippocratic Oath. No, because Which, because you are and that's where I think your tension between quality and length of life does apply because if if you were using harm as the measure then mm. you could be doing more harm by prolonging life than you would be doing by ending it if we see harm and suffering as occupying a very similar space. Yes. Which we do. Although the the only thing I would say to counter it is that um there is a, I mean there are so many concerns about how that element would change the other elements of palliative care yeah. and would that mean that less money was put into high quality palliative care and the, the choices that people are currently able to make about whether they die at home oh, break, or yeah. in a hospice and that that is why ethical debates are a luxury in a sense and that, that, that point i made at the outset about not letting the answer be defined by the detail or by the conflicting experiences that people have had is a little bit naive but but i, I am aware of that it's just the conversation that i wanted to have today so if you cannot guarantee that opening the door to assisted dying will see a diminishment in the investment being made in research and development of terminal illnesses, then you can't go down the road of opening the door to assisted dying. Some would, some would argue, that's the point Bethan is making. It's a point made a little bit more bluntly by, by this text. Dear James, are you not concerned that the government sees voluntary death as an option um, uh, in preference to the cost of research and development into researching for cures or alleviations. I, yeah, I would be, I, 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 except this is not a government decision. This is the parliament in its purest form as, as a kind of representative body, Parli as opposed to delegates. We, we elect people, and I appreciate when you look at some of the characters that have occupied the benches in the House of Commons in recent years, this is a slightly idealistic analysis, but we elect people because we think their judgment is acute or we think their intelligence is yeah all right i'm not going to be able to sell that to you am i in a country where nadine doris could become secretary of state for culture but the theory of parliament is that we fill it with people that we trust to make difficult decisions for the whole of society so that's why keir starmer has given a a, a free vote on this or, or, or at least to his own members that's why keir starmer has promised that in, it, it would become law if the commons votes in favor and there will be no whipping from his side of the house so yeah you, you it's not quite the point that that, that that you intended because it's not a government trying to push things through it's it's a rare example of a conscience vote being guaranteed to become law i wonder when the last time that was probably on abortion actually uh matthew is in uh, keithley in yorkshire matthew what would you like to say Hello, um, Hello, I just wanted to pick up on the issue of first-time caller. Um, Welcome. It's been a long-time listener, but first-time caller. Thank you, mate. Um, yeah, I just wanted to pick up on the issue that was uh, mentioned earlier about how would you staff or how would you actually yes. uh, make, like, get it to function in terms of getting people to, to work it. Uh, I mean, I, I've worked for the NHS since 2018 now as a healthcare support worker, a care assistant. Mm. Um, 
and I think there'd be no shortage of people that would be happy to... Because it would be an act of mercy. Road. It wouldn't be an it act would, of, yeah. of, of, I mean, of sadism or any, any anything weird about it. It yeah. would be an act of mercy. We've got our palliative care teams who, yeah. they're fantastic. And I mean, I, I used to work with someone who was on my ward and she went to work the palliative care team. Right. And it's not because she's sadistic. It's not because she's wanting to see people suffer. It's because she wants to be there for those people in those last moments. Yes. And I think that's one of the... But she doesn't necessarily want things. to cause the last moment. No, I don't think no. it's a completely... It's not a circle, this Venn diagram, is no, it? No, it's not, no. Um, I, I think... Because a lot of patients I've looked after, I've, I've dealt with a lot of patients who have passed away, sadly. And it gets to a point where we're no longer providing mercy, I'd say, at that point. where. We're just prolonging suffering. So what are you hearing today, then, uh, on, on your radio? Are you hearing uh, the ghost of Victorian attitudes to death and religion? The, the, the ghost of pre-medical revolutions talking about why it's so important not to let people end their lives because we need them to be desperate to stay alive for reasons. Yeah, I think we've... I think, especially in the fact that we now live so long. I think we, we, we have clung on to those small Victorian standards of yeah. death, death being something that is unwanted and is, is massive. But I mean, from a personal point of, from a professional point of view, I've worked for, for, for six years, but personally I've cared for my great grandparents, my great nan and my great granddad. My great nan ended up with dementia that she had for around four years and it wasn't her anymore. And she'd said so many times that before she um, got dementia, because she could see it coming, she said, if that ever happens, please just put and her out of misery, because it's I not think, her anymore. Yeah, and, and you know, again, the, the the guarantee against any problems is simply that if any if she didn't want to do that, no one would force her to. It's, exactly, it's, yeah. And, that, and that, but, that is the beginning and the end of it. I mean, it's an extraordinarily popular proposal judging from my inbox i haven't seen the latest polling but i think if if parliament were to re reflect the will of the people then mm. it will sail through but but it's not just the will of the people is it the parliament is the check and balance on the plausibility of it and the and also the the, the efficacy of it and the and the rightness the rectitude yeah. of it and and yet you're not you're pretty clear on all of those things aren't you i think so i think maybe logistically is is the more difficult issue that yes. I've got because it, it, I guess it would mean opening up wards for it um, which would potentially come with um, a bit of stigma so yes. people would say you're going to the death ward or things like that wouldn't they and, um, and how long before someone is writing a column for a right wing newspaper about how selfish it is to want to stay alive well, yeah, well, that's that's up to them, isn't it? Though, <laughs> it's, yes, it is. Really it is, but um, still, you know, it's 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 it, it changes the picture slightly, it does, and that's what yeah. I mean by society having uh, having a role here that is different from the individual's role. The problem is that uh, society here is almost a synonym for for Parliament. Why why was suicide illegal until I, I don't know about fifty years ago? Until until sixty years ago? Why, what I mean, what the, you work out the rationale behind that. And perhaps you work out why, or one of the key elements of this debate. It's 10.46. James O'Brien on LBC. 49 is the time you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Um, I, think I've, I think I know why. I, I, I think it's easy to forget living in this country at this time what religious tyranny looks like. Uh, what, I mean, you know, on a purely pragmatic term, we wouldn't have had laws... Alfred the Great never would have got his laws around the country before the Norman Conquest if it wasn't if they weren't being enacted by bishops. The, the church and the state are almost joined at the hip in the history of these islands. And in order to command obedience, you need a fear of divine punishment. You know, if you if you if you're not frightened of being whipped, then you will be frightened of going to hell. So religion is at the absolute heart of population control. And that means that society has to nurture the notion that life itself, that spark that I was talking about, is something that you're not in charge of. You are not in charge of your own life. If you can somehow swallow the idea that you're not in charge of your own life, then not only are you going to go to church every Sunday, but you are also going to do what you're jolly well told by this curious partnership of church and state. 
So I, I mentioned this because the UK was one of the last countries to decriminalise suicide. So you understand the intrinsic relationship between church and state, not necessarily as a force for good, but as a force for stability, to use that fascinating, multifaceted word, a force for stability, which a moment ago I called population control, and which is, of course, arguably the same thing. But you want a population that is under control. You don't want a population that is out of control, which is why stability is such a nuanced word. So in order to ensure stu stability, you need a marriage of church and state. You need a notion of divine retribution married to common law. And that involves imbuing your life with something that doesn't belong to you. And that's why some of us perhaps are not as clear on the question of assisted dying as we could, and I would argue, should be. So the more religious your upbringing, the, and that's not even true, is it? So the more tendrils there are from your religious upbringing still extending into your thinking and your consciousness, whether you know they're there or not, then the more discombobulated you might be or the more troubled you might be by this. But as I explained in the introduction, whether it's conscious faith or not, it does not give you the right to tell other people how to live or indeed end their lives. Um, and that's why, pain me though it does to say it, Gavin Williamson might have a point when he talks about the importance of removing the bishops from the House of Lords, albeit that I find one of the current crop of senior bishops in this country a profoundly impressive and, and, and thoughtful man. Uh, Yarrick is in Leyland, up in Lancashire. Yarrick, what would you like to say? Hello, James. Hi. You all right? I'm very well. <laughs> oh, good. Um, yeah, James, I'm, I've, um, I'm one of the paramedics, one of the international paramedics who uh, moved to this country in 2016. Gosh. Um, Coming working, over here. Uh, Coming over here, helping us stay yeah. alive. Who do you think you are, honestly? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I hear that a lot. Um, so yeah, 17 years doing this job, so you can imagine that I've been, you know, uh, coming across death on different levels, yes. y you name it, and, and probably I was the, um, I couldn't wait until this was a national debate, really? because every time I go to, to work and I have to come across people who are not alive, I wouldn't call it a living, I would just call it an existing in suffering um, yeah. Numerous of people who can't say anything about the state of um, their bodies, about anything that's going on around them. And many times, obviously, I understand that families struggle to say goodbye to their relatives. And, you know, they, by all costs, they want to keep them um, close and they want to see them alive. But I think as a society, we forgot to say goodbye and how to say goodbye uh, at the end of our lives. Um, medicine now is so advanced that it allows us to keep our bodies running along, but yes. yet we don't have the medication to keep our brains healthy um, with diseases which, which like is, Alzheimer's, which, dementia. Which is why yeah. that concept of a spark that I introduced to the conversation earlier is, is probably a bit out of date, isn't it? Yeah, I think so, because... It, I think, you know, we, we didn't have a deba debate about how we, in a way, are torturing people because I, I can't name this state sometimes that I find people in other than being tortured, you know, not having anything like hospital avoidance plan in place because family didn't agree for. Right. Um, and by the law, obviously, as an ambulance service, we all always um, have to um, go um, with, 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 the, with the law and the procedures so we take people to hospitals um you know people who are bed bound with with pressure sores to their bones uh, who are peg fed which is the direct to uh, digestive system tube that is, is is feeding them overnight does it sound silly people to like you and don't, don't be polite but does it sound silly to you when we start talking about ethics and 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 spiritual or sanctity and and these these almost philosophical luxuries when in fact you're looking at people dying and you are lengthening their death. Yeah, yeah. I think this is it. We are talking about morals in this conversation and, and uh, ethnicity and, uh, sorry, not ethnicity. <laughs> uh, <laughs> ethics. The, 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 yeah, ethics, sorry. Um, still a foreigner. 
<laughs> um, uh, we, are, we are talking about that, but nobody's discussing uh, uh, the, the morals around the care that we are, you know, putting our relatives through. And I, I say that I, with all honesty, I think the families just don't know what actually happens around their relatives. You know, they come to see them. They are, they are changed. They are, they are in their beds. They look comfortable, but that's because they are on medications that will keep them comfortable. Because you know, it's <laughs> another thing. You know, you, you've made that comment. You've read that comment about are we not forcing? You know, instead of instead of introducing this end of life um, uh, law, uh, why are we not forcing to um, government to? Uh, try and find a cure for dementia yes. and stuff like that. I think I think pharmaceutical companies, as they work, if they realise that they are losing clients, because I'm going to just call them that way. Wow. People, I know people where you're going with this. Homes, I know where you're going with this, yeah, and I'm going to sit back people, for a minute. Hey, <laughs> uh, people in care homes who lost their capacity a long time ago. They don't recognize their relatives. They are even sometimes aggressive towards them. Mm. Um, you know, you, you go and see them and they are on 20 medications. You know, I'm exaggerating probably, but, you know, we keep the hearts running. We keep the uh, lungs running, livers. We look after all the organs with medications we can have. But... <sighs> It's a perfect scenario for pharmaceutical companies, you know, to, 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 get, to, <laughs> yeah, to, to, to come out of the blocks at 100 miles an hour. And in this context, even the word sanctity, <laughs> the word sanctity just sounds weird, doesn't it? In the context yeah. of what you're saying to me, it sounds weird and inappropriate almost. And yet, you know, the whole of Judeo-Christian society has been built upon it. But arguably, we don't live in one anymore, whether, whether you want to or not. That's not an opinion. That's that's counting. Yarek, thank you. Uh, last word on this to Jackie down at the other end of the country in Cornwall. Jackie, what would you like to say? Hi there, James. Hello. It's the first time I've... I've really well, I'm glad you've picked really a nice, nervous. simple, straightforward, uncontroversial, <laughs> really, really easy topic, Jackie. What would you like to say? I know. It is something I'm, I'm very passionate about because I've been in a very privileged position to care for my mum. Okay. Often she, she died in my arms. Mm. And to be with my dad when he passed, I'd had to put him in a care home because he got vascular dementia and right. it just, I couldn't, I couldn't care for him. Yes. Um, but I absolutely believe that, that people have the right to choose when they die. Um, my mum was had been bed bound for the last six months of her life. Uh, she'd got horrendous bed sores that I could, even though she was on a hospital bed at home, yeah. and I could put my my finger in don't, the hole. Don't, don't, well, do actually I'm because sorry. this is what we're. No, no, I'm sorry because it's me being squeamish. Whereas this is in fact the suffering that you are keen to spare other people. Yeah, yeah, and I I really am, um, and. So mum would always get chest infections because, you know, they can't clear the lungs properly. Yeah. Um, so the, the GP came and mum got another chest infection and I said to mum, and the doctor said she needs to go to hospital, and I said... Um, God, she knew said, you mentioned her you? then, didn't she, the dog? I, I know. That was, that was spooky, actually. Was, oh, it's, it's, why are you talking about me on the radio? He said, I heard that. That was, that was extraordinary. Sorry. I, I know it was a sensitive moment, but everyone else noticed no, the dog fine. bark, so I had to point it's it out. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the doctor said, yeah, you'll need to go to hospital. And mum looked at me and I said, do you want to go to the hospital? And she shook her head. No. And I said, OK. And uh, then I said, you know, you might die. And mum nodded her head, and I went, OK. And I oh, said, have you had you. enough? And she went, yeah. Uh -huh. And I said, OK, no problem. And six days later, she died. We but won't go to hospital. And that six days of, uh, well, who knows? But, but, but that, that moment of self-knowledge is something that, having spoken to you, Jackie, and to everybody else this hour, I don't think, for all my skills in the debating chamber, um, I don't think you could deny, I don't think you could meaningfully argue that you deny people that moment of self-knowledge and all of its consequences. I don't think you can. I'd be surprised if this doesn't become law. Um, and we'll find out quite soon. Jackie, take care. It's 11 o'clock. James O'Brien on LBC. It is four minutes after 11. You are 
listening to James O'Brien on LBC. I, I said, sorry for the pause there. I'm just thinking that, that this story's really weird, and I think I know why. The number of parents, the proportion of parents who are opposed to fines for non-attendance in school of their children. What do you think it is? I know Nick did this story earlier, but if you weren't paying attention or you weren't listening, what, what do you think it is? Actually, can you text me on that? Uh, genuinely. So you, 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 you line up 100 parents and you say, do you think that you should be fined for taking your children out of school during term time for, for non-medical reasons, you know, to go on holiday or to go to the darts or whatever it might be. Actually, leave the darts out of it because I think I could probably make quite a compelling case for you being allowed to take your children out of school to go to the darts. So to go on holiday, what what percentage do you think it would be? Out of 100 people, how many do you think would say, no, you should not be fined. You should be free to take your child out of school to go on holiday. Text me the number now, 84850, or WhatsApp it to 0345 6060 I'm with you, Callum. I'd have said about 20%. Um, I don't know that Jamie's taking it seriously when he says 80%. Lewis, I think, is uh, trying to invoke the ghost of Brexit. Five past 11, Keith, before we mention the word Brexit today, and it's Lewis's fault, not mine, when he suggests 48%. Yeah, here you go, 20, 28%, 25%, 23%. Um, again, I'm not sure Jack's taking it seriously when he says 93%. Can't be more than 40%. I'd have, I'd have said that. Um, and most people most people are going between 20 and 30, with a few outliers, I should be clear. Um, but remember, I can see your name. So if you're the same person sending in high, high, high numbers, then I, I can see you. And you're not. You're spoiling the fun for everybody else. You're letting the show down. You're letting the switchboard down. But most of all, you're letting yourself down. I, could, I don't know how interesting this is for you. But when I sometimes do a question like this, I could sit here all day. I won't tell you who it was. I did my holiday cover a hundred years ago and they've gone on to a glittering and, and wonderful career at the BBC. Uh, but, uh, but a million years ago when we were both complete non-entities, he, did, he or she did my holiday cover <laughs> and, and they did a text vote and no one had really explained to him what a text vote was. A text vote generally involves me asking a question, you texting in your answers and the producer totting up the results, bringing it in to me and I go, well, that's fascinating. In this completely unscientific space-filling exercise, we have discovered that 46% of people think that I, uh, goldfish should be banned from prize giving at fairgrounds. I'm not even making it up. That was in the news this week, although I made up the figure. But this lad was doing my holiday cover. And uh, when I got back, they told me there were two great stories that I came back to from holiday cover once. And the, the first was that he did a text vote and he read out all the answers. So he sat here having said, should, you know, should Anne Widdicombe resign or something like that? And he sat here going, yes, yes, no, 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 yes. Yes, no, no. I don't know how long it went on for, but in my mind, I like to think it was at least 10 minutes. I could do that. I, I quite like that on a day like today. I, I quite like looking at all. But then, of course, eventually you run out of numbers. There's only 100 if you're looking for a percentage. Eventually, we'd have heard all of them. And at that point, surely the, the interest in the issue disappears, except to point out that lots and lots and lots of them that were, were, were the same number. Yeah, so I would say if I had to pick an average, looking at it now, it'd be about 28%. The figure is 50. The figure is 50. 50% of parents oppose fines for non-attendance and only 44% support them, with, with obviously a few don't knows in the middle. That's extraordinary, isn't it? Um, the, the rationale that you offer up, the rationale that you offer up is... I'm not going to be part of a really scandalous process by which companies scalpers. It's like dynamic pricing. Everyone got upset about dynamic pricing at the Oasis concert without mentioning, actually probably some people who are cleverer than me did mention it, that this is the British holiday market. This is the, the international holiday market in a nutshell. You know, there's, there's much more demand during the school holidays. Therefore, they ramp the prices up. The, 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 the idea that you change your prices according to demand, according to how popular something is, is, I mean, it's basic supply and demand. But it feels unfair because you can't exercise a sort of freedom of choice. You can't exercise the um, uh, uh, free market element of this conversation as a customer because you can't go on holiday during term time. 57% said the penalties have no impact on their decision to take term time breaks. So what you've got here is a measurable majority of people who not only think that the fines are wrong, 
but also don't let the fines affect them anyway because it's only and i know to many people 80 quid is quite a lot of money but to at least 57 percent of people it's nothing they've gone up from 60 pounds to 80 pounds this year in a drive to boost attendance and they are not working so i think i know why i haven't got the figures from 10 years ago but i'm confident it would have been much lower i, I lower even i think that lockdown will have had quite a big impact on this i think either consciously or subconsciously if your kids missed months of school and i know they were supposed to be doing it online and, and i know that a lot of them did but it wasn't the same if your kids missed and, and you can you could kid yourself that they're going to do their school work on holiday aren't they well you're in the um all you can eat buffet they'll be upstairs doing their latin homework so i think lockdown subconsciously and consciously created in the minds of parents the idea that school is less important than we used to think it was so five years ago i would have conducted this conversation from a perspective not of condescension necessarily but certainly of sententiousness from from a position of judgment i would have judged you and I, I still might. I don't, you know, don't relax yet. I still might judge you. But I think the question is different today from what it was five years ago. Because consciously or subconsciously, the idea has been created in the minds of parents that school is not actually as important as they used to think it was because and i know the privations of, of lockdowns and the damage done to generations of children by being kept out of school notwithstanding separate from that and two things can be true at the same time remember the damage of lockdown can be well documented but the subconscious change in your opinion to school will also be real you're kind of thinking do you know what i think i will take them out i'm going to save i'm going to save hundreds of pounds if we go during term time, I'm going to save hundreds of pounds if we go three days before the end of term. Uh, because I, 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 they missed how much school during lockdown. And they're still here. They're still doing okay. They've done well in their GCSEs. So what if they miss a bit of their A-levels? 11-11 is the time. I like to approach this topic by asking teachers first, but it's always tricky during term time to, to know how many are listening. Usually we do okay, but for teachers, can you talk me through how big a deal it is and whether or not you recognise my suggestion that it's got worse because of lockdown? And that won't just be in the context <clears throat> of, of unauthorised absences. It'll be that, I know this is a bit of a cliché, but when I was a child, it was very much parents and teachers on the same side with the child on the other side. Apparently, that sounds combative, which it was sometimes, but I'm, I'm conveying or trying to convey more that it is parents and teachers joined forces in what they consider to be the child's best interests, right? But when I was a kid, that was very much the case. I guess, I suppose, you want to get all serious and, and, and post therapy about it. That's why corporal punishment exists. And so many parents today find it impossible to grasp the notion that you'd give another adult the right to beat your child. But parents and teachers combined in the belief that this was in the best interests of the child. I, I have tracked a breach in that contract over the years in which I've been doing this job. I, the extreme example would be the child marching into school to threaten to beat up the teacher that had had the audacity to tell their child off, or the parent who objects furiously to their child being given a detention or being disciplined in any way whatsoever, or the parent who um, essentially targets teachers on parents' evening for not telling them what they want to hear about their own children. I think there's been a breach in that contract but i still think that if you're taking a child out of school during term time you're a, you're bang out of order and i know i can afford to do it during the holidays and i know that it is therefore uh, me speaking from a position of luxury but the only people who can tell me whether or not this is acceptable behavior are the people who are teaching your children not you and so what I'd like to do first is establish what it does to a classroom and how big the problem actually is. And how, how I mean, you know, in a given week, how likely is it that you will have children who, whatever their parents have said, you are pretty confident 
the children are are not in school because they're on holiday. Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three. So how big is the problem? But also how big is the problem? You see what I mean? What well, the statistics of it, the reality of your experience numerically, but also the reality of your experience educationally. What does it do to your ability to teach a classroom full of children when more and more of them, with the uh, connivance of their irresponsible parents, are clearing off to, um, uh, I don't know, Tenochtitlan or Mexico City for a fortnight when they should be in class doing their algebra and their geography. 0345 973 is the number that you need. And then I, I want you to tell me why I'm wrong on this because I think that my opinions have shifted a little bit as well o- over that period of time, that the holiday companies rinsing families for going on holidays that could be in many ways life-changing or the highlight of your absolute year five years ago i'd have sat here and told you i'd have i'd have done that thing i do sometimes when i'm dealing with dishonest right-wingers i'd have said you know get a, get a better job or, or cancel your netflix subscription so when people who are really on their uppers describe what it's like to be poor lazy right-wing commentators like to pretend and indeed lazy right-wing politicians actually maybe lazy is not fair maybe they're just horrible horrible right-wing politicians and horrible right-wing commentators like to pretend it's really easy not to be poor you get a better job or you use value range food or you cook a meal for 30p a day or you uh, cancel your netflix subscription or you eat fewer avocados so i probably five years ago would have played that role in a slightly tongue-in-cheek way You'd have rung me up and said, well, we're going to Disneyland. There's no way we could afford it during the school holidays. And I would have said, well, you need to get a better job then. Why are you such a failure? And it would have been, I don't know, mildly amusing, but also unfair. What difference does it make in the classroom? 03456060973. How widespread is the practice now? 03456060973. And does this need to be added to the list of things that I used to go in far too hard, far too fast on back in the day? I was pretty vile, I think, to some parents who rang in to tell me that they took their children on holiday for educational purposes. I, I'm, I'm 52, 48 on this. 52% of me thinks they deserved it. 48% of me is thinking that they're wrong. Whereas back in the day, it would have been 100% deserved it. 0%. I might be wrong. Let's find out. What do we think as parents? What do we think as parents about this issue now? And then perhaps we can compare it to what we felt five years ago. Hit the numbers now. You know the rest. You know the number. But I tell you anyway, otherwise I end up speaking to the same people every day. 0345 6060 973. James O'Brien on LBC. 18 minutes after 11. I, you, I, you can probably tell I'm in one of those moves. I think it's because I started putting... Um, peanut butter in my morning shake i think i've got a little bit more energy in the mornings and when i've got a little bit more energy i i, I kind of go an extra mile when i'm thinking about stuff no i'm not suggesting that's a good thing for a moment but i'm hearing echoes in my own thoughts of the conversation we had in the last hour would you believe as a kind of post-victorian hangover particularly with regard to that relationship between parent and school when it comes to combining for the child's welfare even if the child doesn't like it who's on your team that well, as a parent the teacher is as a teacher the parent is who's on the other team the child that's not true anymore and my 52 year old post-victorian Catholic small c big c sensibilities think that's a bad thing but it isn't a bad thing because the reason why so many of my classmates got abused was because teachers had succeeded in persuading parents that they were on the right side they were on the same side and that left kids exploited and alone so I, I, the big picture idea that I have that we've lost something when parents do not support teachers is a lot more nuanced than I would have realised 10 years ago. But does it open the door towards a widespread belief that it's fine to take your kids out of school and go on holiday because you'll save a few quid? What lessons are you teaching your children? Chris is in Wishaw in Scotland. Chris, what would you like to say? Hi, James. It's, uh, it's, it's Claire. Claire. Why did I say yes. Chris? Good Lord. I'm going to have to get... <laughs> do you know what? Talking about age, I'm going to have to get some of those bifocal glasses, I think. Oh. I know. Tell me about it. Oh, Tell me lordy, about it. lordy. Go on. I'm what's on your you. mind? Um, well, obviously, I'm in I'm in Scotland, and we are off this week, so I'm not oh, I'm yes, not skipping. Yes. I'm not skipping school or anything. Um, <laughs> so I, I think I 
And most other people that I know come this at quite a different perspective. That when I actually hear a child off on holiday, I'm like, oh, that's that's good. They're not sick. They're not ill. But actually, I think family holidays are really, really important. Well, yeah, so do I, but not during term yeah. time. Yeah, no, I know that. I know that. But at the same time, we're. I, I'm not going to speak to anybody else at this moment in time, I'm more concerned about the children who are not turning up to school because of poverty-related issues or because their children have mental health issues, uh, sorry, their parents have mental health issues, or indeed the children have mental health issues, and I just feel that the energy should be poured into that because they are the children who are going to be left behind. Is it either or? Is it really? And you're the teacher, not me, so you do think it's either or. You think resources and efforts that are poured into stopping people taking unauthorised absences for holidays could instead I mean, be poured I, I, into helping children and families who, who, whose kids aren't turning up to school because of, of very different problems. Other issues. Don't get me wrong, I think if a parent was taking a child out for two weeks every term or, or and it was significant, but particularly if a parent is taking a child out for, for example, three or four days at yeah. the end of June when, when we finish, I mean, school is much more laid back at that time of year anyway. I mean, I will say that... that so what age do you pe- teach? What age do you teach? Um, it's primary four, so it's, what, year three it would be. Okay, so, yeah, I mean, if this was a secondary school, it would be a no. bit different, because you've got someone... It might well be. Someone's missed a week of quite a tricky yeah. part of the curriculum, yeah, and, yeah, and they're, they're going to be held back by that for the rest of the academic year, aren't they? Yeah, absolutely. I agree with that. I agree with that completely. I think in, in primary school it is different, but we're just looking more about the whole child and about... Fair enough. And I, I just I hear so much about these fines and it's not something we would ever, ever consider. I don't, I don't, I don't want to become too reasonable, Claire. I'm a, I'm a radio <laughs> phone-in host, for goodness sake. It'd be career suicide <laughs> to become too reasonable. But some of these attitudes are probably born of the days when you had only one parent working. Yeah, uh, whereas exactly. now, if both parents are working, getting any time away together as a, as a yep. whole family unit is is really, really is precious, really special. Absolutely. Absolutely. And do we buy yeah, the idea that you can't? I mean, what about the, the slightly unkind argument when people say, oh, there's no earthly way I could afford it if I went during the school holidays time? I said, no, but you could afford a less expensive holiday, so go on that one. Yeah, but I can understand, the, um, like you mentioned about a family going to Mexico, or particularly if they're going somewhere that's a unique cultural experience or yeah. is a one-off, a one, once-in-a-lifetime family holiday, that child will probably gain as much from that as they would from a weekend school. They might not remember the four times table as quickly as they would have otherwise. But they'll remember a visit to Machu Picchu. Exactly. If they exactly. do a visit to I mean, what if they spend four, you know, what if they spend a fortnight on a sunbed next to a pool while their dad makes his way through the all-you-can-drink bar? I mean, that's a different kind or of holiday mom. altogether, isn't it? Yes, it is. They but might... I mean, I don't know what holiday is more likely to be happening. Statistically, it's more likely to be a sort of package holiday in a, in a hotel than it is to be a cultural enrichment experience in, in, in uh, the Yucatan Peninsula. Are they meeting children from different parts uh, of the country or different parts good. of the world? She's good. Are they, are they, oh, that's the nicest thing anyone's <laughs> ever said to me. But yeah, I just, I just don't get the, the... Maybe in parts of England it is a huge issue. It's not so much where I'm from. It's, it, the school that I work in is particularly an area that's not especially wealthy. Okay. Um, we, have, we have a huge spread, but I still don't see... like As long as parents don't expect me to catch their children up straight away... Yeah, and and that might be why some of your colleagues in in, in secondary school will have slightly different, possibly even violently differing opinions. But I like your thinking. I do. I like the idea of of recognising the importance of a holiday. And and it doesn't quite close the debate. Well, it doesn't even come close to closing the debate down because nobody is saying don't go on holiday. They're just saying don't go on holiday in term time. I struggle to believe that you really have no choice. I think you're just going on on a more expensive holiday or a more... Um, a, a luxurious holiday than you would be able to afford at, at, at the other time of year. Lots of you, this always happens. I'd forgotten about this. Ever we start having this conversation, everyone starts telling me how expensive centre parks is. Why? I know how expensive centre parks is. I wouldn't describe centre parks as a less exotic holiday than a week on the Yucatan Peninsula. Like, centre parks is really expensive. I, I think we've only been once. And that's part of the reason why. So I don't, I don't know why everyone always sends me a message saying centre parks. So oh, let me tell you about an expense. Da, 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 da. Claire, thank you. Henry's in Epping Forest. Is there a centre parks in Epping Forest? I don't think there is, is there, Henry? 
No, no, there's no centre park. Uh, well, is there? I don't know. Maybe in the far flung reaches, I'm more towards London. But what made you pick up the phone? What made you pick up the phone? Because I think you've come up the issue from the wrong perspective, James. You know, I know it's a black and white thing, and you know, I don't think it is a black and white thing. I think it used to be a black and white thing, but I think it has greyed up a little bit, and we're trying to work out why. But I think, like you, there's the assertion of the, the right wing people calling up. There are less subscriptions, less avocados, right? That's all well and good. And about the term time stuff and the expense of holidays is I can save a couple hundred quid. Yes. But when over the last 10 years, since 2008, you haven't had real term, really like income in real terms, go up. You've had it go down. You've yes. had a pandemic. You've had people lose their jobs and their homes and suffer and all this stuff. And then you have all this extra issue on top. It's like if a parent wants to try and give their child an opportunity to go out of, outside of the country and see somewhere and maybe just have a little bit of time off. I think it's valid. You know, the disruption that brings to the classroom isn't it's not as bad as what we think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that's changed. It, maybe I, see, I talk about the subconscious and conscious change in the minds of parents. Maybe the same thing as maybe the same thing has happened to teachers as well because of what you've just described. These are these are mind changing experiences. Whether you notice that your mind is being changed or not. Yeah, but it depends on what kind of, you know, kids you've got. I mean, like, uh, your producer kind of asked me, is like, you know, do they disrupt? And it's like, well, yeah, of course. You get kids who are really disruptive. And, mm -hmm. you know, bigger impact has been COVID. COVID has been a real impact. The development of some children, you get kids in the young... I mean, I teach secondary, but, you know, we got we got all ages in the, in the school I teach in. And some of the younger kids have really, really severe issues in focus and development. And it's because they want... Uh, they weren't in school. Yeah, but right? you're but you're here to tell me it's good it's good that they're not coming to school more. But the difference, mate. The you coming? There's a contradiction there that some people will be in need of clarification. This, yeah, and this is where the nuance comes in. It's like if you take a school out of kid, as the previous caller said, yeah, for two weeks, problematic, right? And if, if you keep a school out, if you keep a kid out of school and don't educate them and don't stimulate them, problematic for a child's development, right? Yes. But if you're taking them for three days at the end of the time, so you can take them on holiday and spend time with family, they're getting that development, they're getting that attachment time, they're getting that... But, the, but the rule is the same for the three days at the end of term as it would be for the two weeks in the middle of term. Well, the rules should be changed. It'd be more yeah. leeway. You know, some kids, when they're not in school, because they've gone... Well, doesn't the end of term begin to move then? Do you, put, do you put films on on the last couple of days of term? You stick a video on or something? No, like no. We, you know, I bet I you just, do. We sort of don't... No, no, no. <laughs> No way, because because the whole point. sword in the that, stone or something like that. No, <laughs> because I teach because I teach and make my curriculum interesting. But let's most, say ten percent, ten percent of the kids aren't there for the last three days of term. Next year it'll be twenty percent. No, listen, no? like it's the case of like oh, it's a slippery slope, bar. you know. Well, it is. It's, it's sort of like. It is a slippery slope. slope. I mean, that's why they've increased the fine from £60 to £80, because too many people it, are, are taking the hit at £60, so they're trying to make the slope good. less slippery. Here's a good parallel for you, right? TfL spends £22 million a year on tackling fare evasion, and they raise £2.1 million catching the fare evaders, right? The amount of resources, I don't know the schools for the Department of Education. Yeah, well, here's a good, ana here's a good analogy for you. Imagine how much fare evasion there would be if they didn't spend £22 million a year on catching people. No one would yeah, ever pay they, for a tube they, ticket. They, so your analogy has done the precise opposite of what you thought it was going to do. James, look, there's still a problem. No, with just you pause to take to on, take, pause to take on board what I've just said. The reason why that is money well spent is because if there were no penalties in place or people pursuing fair dodgers, everyone would be a fair dodger. So you've completely demolished your own argument with that analogy. No, you are yes. not quite getting it up there because basically, I was working on. Like, we're getting distracted from the No, we're not. Thing. We're picking up on a point you right, thought right. was a zinger, right. which is actually the polar opposite of a zinger. You've made a case for why you need really strong penalties to stop these people no, no, from no, no. doing the thing. Well, you can but, keep but, saying but, no, 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 no. Why do you think there aren't more fair evaders on the London Underground? Because fair evasion and education is not the same thing. Well, why people did you... Hang on, you're the teacher. You just brought it into the conversation, champ. Yeah, I'm using it as a, as a precedent point. And I'm right? pointing out to you why it's the polar opposite of the precedent point that you thought it was. What do you teach, Henry? I teach economics and music. Okay. Well, I hope your music's better than your economics. It's half past 11. Thomas Watts is here with your headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. 33 minutes after 11 is the time. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. I, is it? Can we do an idiot's corner for someone who hasn't contacted the programme but has been an idiot in a different space? Or should we keep the parameters of Idiot's Corner quite tight? What do you think? 
If I if it was Jacob Rees Mogg, would you change the rules? If it was the penny farthing in human form, I, I've I've just seen a tweet he's put about slavery reparations. He says they ought to pay us for ending slavery. It is not something any other country had done, and we were motivated by Christian charity. Uh, they did, mate. Slavers got paid in modern terms absolutely billions of pounds. But they actually got refunded by the state for their slaves. Jacob Rees Mogg is the main reason why Eton College doesn't do refunds. They'd be bankrupt by Christmas if they had to pay back the school fees to the parents of people that somehow emerge from the finest education that money can buy in a state of such extraordinary ignorance. So um, the question of quite how Christian charity translates into demanding that the descendants of slaves give money to the descendants of slavers is one that will leave between him and his father confessor. 11.34 is the time. So I don't know, Idiot's Corner, or do we need something else? We have got a new feature, and it's a really good one, and I'm going to do it now. Claire and Nicola are up next. I'm on a hiding to nothing on this one, and I wouldn't have been five years ago, especially not two teachers. First two calls, first two teachers, both in favour of children going on holiday during term time. There's a big change here, a big change underway, a big change almost complete. Five years ago, it was entirely the other way around. General consensus was if you take your children on, on holiday during term time, you're, you're doing some bad parenting. And if you're claiming that it's educational or cultural, then you're swinging the lead. Now, appears to be early doors the, the other way around. But um, missed information is I've been trying to finesse what it is. It's a new feature. We can't really do unhinged headline anymore. Or anywhere, we're not going to get anywhere near as many unhinged headlines as we used to do because um, Labour's in power and therefore the headlines about how Liz Truss is a genius or Labour is going to eat your cats and dogs, uh, they don't land in quite the same way and they don't appear with anything like the same frequency. And we can't really do smear Keir anymore because that has become essentially the, the raison d'etre of, of the entire print media uh, at the moment you are supposed to be furious that he um, disappeared shrugged off his security shortly after a nato summit meeting where the poisoning of the attempted poisoning of the script house in salisbury and the murder of dawn sturgis was discussed and he got rid of his security disappeared still in possession of papers that he would have been using while at that meeting and turned up instead at the palazzo of a kgb oh sorry no i've got the wrong prime minister um, uh, Keir Starmer met Taylor Swift. So he can't do smear Keir anymore, otherwise we'd never have time to do anything else on the programme. So missed information is an attempt to show you how a headline, and it will usually be a headline, is deliberately designed to be completely misleading. So much so that a weird form of symbiosis appears in the newspaper industry, whereby a columnist who has read the article will pretend that they haven't in order to construct an angry column based upon the emotion that is deliberately conveyed by the headline. This is something that Stuart Lee takes to an art form. He, he, ta he, he takes it to... He is the Leonardo da Vinci of dissecting this kind of thing, culminating in the, in, the, in, the, in the famous case of the taxi driver who says you can't say anything about immigration, you can't say you're English in this country anymore without being sent to jail. So that mad uh, acceleration from deliberately misleading headline to apparently sincerely held opinion about something that's completely not true. So today's headline is brilliant, and this is in the Times. I prefer these examples when they're from the supposedly more mature end of the market. Not saying hello at work breaches employment law. So how, what do you do if you're Richard Littlejohn? How do you write a column about this? Well, you say, Kai, you know, do you know what? You can get, you get, you can get into trouble. You can get your collar felt these days, even if you don't say hello. There I was at work the other day, minding my business. I got a little bit distracted by something on the telly. Uh, Nick Ferrari walked in. I didn't say hello, and now I'm in jail. What do you mean you, you can breach employment law by not saying hello? This is... An incredibly infuriating headline. But is it an incredibly infuriating story? No, because it's a story about a woman who had a number of grievances, including the fact that she was deliberately and roundly ignored by her own employer. Um, that's bullying. I was watching Industry on the telly the other night. I don't know if you've seen it yet. It's really good. It's, it's, it's set in the city and it sort of follows the... Uh, fortunes of some new 
recruits in the city and one of them is d and and it's a bit like newspapers used to be when i started there in that you'd, you'd, you'd encounter older people who were deliberately obnoxious it was almost considered to be a rite of passage and there's one character in industry who doesn't acknowledge the existence of these young recruits he did so they will say would you like a cup of tea how are you good morning and he deliberately completely ignores them which I guess you can still just about get away with in the city. But in civilised society, that is behaviour that should be discouraged. And if you don't respond to polite discouragement, that is behaviour that human resources should get involved in because it's bullying. And it does not mean that if you forget to say hello, if I forget to say hello to Keith, Keith, have I said hello to you? I have, haven't I? I held the door open for you. Twice I said hello to you this morning. I'm, I must have been subconsciously... Uh, accommodating this story i must have been subconsciously protecting myself from accusations of not having said hello to keith i said hello to him twice and i held the door open for him on the way into the studio despite the fact that i carry a cup of tea that is approximately half a ton so i would not be in breach of employment law if i had forgotten to say hello to keith this morning or if i had uh, not heard him say hello to me and therefore not responded so there it is uh, there's um he also withheld sick pay from her because he thought she was faking an illness so here's the story not saying hello at work breaches employment law by the time you get halfway through it you learn uh, she also succeeded in a claim of unauthorized deduction because he her boss was found to have withheld sick pay because he thought she was faking an illness um obnoxious behavior and unlawful deduction of wages is the story not failing to say hello to someone at work breaches employment law so that is how misinformation is going to work it will be my attempt to prove to you why the people in my profession dedicated to making you very angry about things that aren't true how they operate and how it works and there's a lovely example so let's look out for whether or not anyone tries to cobble together a newspaper column based upon the absolute farrago of nonsense conveyed by the headline 20 to 12 is the time. Back to school. And the increasing popularity among parents of the idea of parents taking their children on holiday during term time. And I am a little surprised, I don't know how representative it is, to discover that teachers are a lot more in favour of it. Even finding two teachers in favour of it is at odds with all of my experiences in this field pre-COVID or pre-lockdown. Robert's in Bracknell. Robert, what would you like to say? Oh, hi. Sorry. A uh, bit nervous. First time caller. It's only me. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, I, I think we have to remember that the head teacher of any school and the governing body have uh, the ability to agree to take children out of school during term time. So if you've got yes. a really good reason for taking children out, you know, any reasonable head teacher will agree to that. And I think my experience is the kind of parents... Um, that want to take their children on a very important holiday or cultural trip or yes. maybe it's to go abroad, um, you know, to see, you know, I've known of cases where um, children's grandparents have, have, have been very ill yes. and not, not expected perhaps to live much longer. And so it's really key that those children go. And a good he head teacher would agree to that. And the kind of parents um, that do take their children abroad for legitimate reasons generally ask for homework. So they would ask me, they would say, I know my child's going to miss um, maths this week and English and whichever lessons and would say, can I have homework to make sure my child stays up to date? And so that's that's absolutely fine. The problem arises when children go out of school and for no good reason and they miss so much because most lessons are cumulative. You know, you learn one of thing course. and you build on it week on week. And so, you know, as a teacher, I mean, I'm retired now. I've been just retired this year. Oh, that's but, nice. you know, that's why I'm at home. I've got time to talk to you. How are you going on? Uh, are you enjoying it or are you kicking your heels uh, already? No, no, I'm, I've got lots of hobbies. So I'm really, Fantastic. yeah, no, it's, it's good so far. Good man. Um, uh, and where's the cumulative the point there you go you see you're already slipping a bit mentally yeah. there because you're not in the <laughs> classroom right, yeah. every day yeah, keeping, your, keeping your wits sharp no we're yeah. talking about the fact that you put all the effort into lesson planning into cumulative learning into curriculum pursuits and then you know yeah. uh, someone opts out of it for a week or a fortnight and then someone else does and someone else does and you're trying to sort of yeah. build, you, it's like trying to you're building a house and you've got to go back to the first layer of bricks and replace some of them 
Yeah, exactly. And you're trying to do the same lesson sometimes two or three times. And that's really infuriating um, because I put so much time and effort into designing a really good lesson, knowing that the next lesson will build on the last one. And then you've got children that aren't there just because. I see. I think what you're describing is a no brainer, which is why I remain surprised, particularly by the secondary school teacher that we spoke to in Epping Forest a moment ago, by how blasé they are about the idea of just sliding away early for a holiday without having the, the reasons in place that you remind us would be considered by a head teacher as grounds for permission to be granted for for the trip abroad it's interesting that you've just retired robert did you detect over the course of your career but, but and and you had enough experience post covid to make that comparison as well that that contract between teacher and parent has changed during the course of your working life um or not? i haven't i've not experienced that Good. personally um But what I did find that when we gave lessons in lockdown and we set everything up so children could learn at home, um, even to the extent where we would help parents with the technology and lend them laptops, um, a lot of parents just didn't bother. They just, yeah, they just, you know, even though you've spent all that time kind of setting up all the technology, a lot of them didn't opt into it. Um, Probably only in my experience, about 20% of parents actually did you know help to their children oh, with the gosh. school work and you don't think um, that is different from what it would have been 20 years previously that there would have been a higher degree of um conscientiousness among parents then well, we um, can't know can I, we i don't think in such a short period of time i mean relatively 20 years is not that long um i don't think 20 years ago it would have been significantly different okay. but in, the That's other point i don't The other point I'd like to make is that, you know, a lot of parents will say, well, actually, we're on a low income. We can't afford to go during um, term time because it's so expensive. But actually, you know, teachers are on a relatively low income. um, Mm. And we have to be in school. I can't, you know, my children are grown up now, but I couldn't take my children out of school during term time. You know, the head teacher would have said, no way. (laughs) You, you um, certainly hope so, so. That might be the next chapter of this story. A teacher start. Like, how much would you be fined if you yeah. went on holiday during term time and, and rang in sick with the sound of seagulls in Margate uh, sort of c- c- cackling away in the background? Uh, thank you, Robert. Enjoy your retirement. I'm intrigued by, w- by what your hobbies are. When someone says I've got lots of hobbies, but I think it would be indelicate of me to to pry. It's eleven forty six. James O'Brien on LBC. <laughs> It wasn't Oedipus, it was Jocasta. I owe you a profound apology. In fact, given that we're discussing Greek tragedy, I feel I should indulge in some form of self-flagellation or or something like that. So, without giving too much away about one of the finest productions I have ever seen on the London stage, currently running at the Wyndham's Theatre. I mentioned this on um, social media last night, and someone accused me of being London-centric, and I thought, I, I understand what you mean, but I live here. So if you if you live in Wigan and you go to the theatre in Wigan or you go to the rugby in, in Wigan, you the Challenge Cup final perhaps at Old Trafford uh, on Saturday, and you tweet about it, I wouldn't accuse you of being Wigan-centric. I, I appreciate sometimes the news has a, has a London skew, but you can't accuse someone of being biased towards the place where they live because they live where they live. So anyway, I was at the Wyndham Theatre last night with well, Mark Strong and Leslie Manville who Leslie Manville's been on Full Disclosure as well. Is that a new rate? That's three people we've mentioned on the show today who've been on Full Disclosure. Justin Welby, Kim Ledbeater, and Leslie Manville. Is there anyone else that we've popped up in our contemplations and conversations that has actually already featured on Full Disclosure? It's David Jason this week, one of my all-time favourites. Uh, Sir David Jason to you, Keith. But I can call him David because we're quite, you know, we're chummy now that we've done a, a big sit-down interview together. Really, really, really lovely interview, which I, I can't wait to start sharing with you, I think on Friday. But the line I was telling you earlier about you don't want to know everything, you don't want to know the bad stuff. But Human nature sometimes, if you know that you've got a bad diagnosis, you don't want to know everything that's going to happen to you. It wasn't Oedipus that said that. That's Oedipus's hubris in a way isn't it that need to know everything in the aristotelian theory of tragedy that you've got the fatal flaw the thing that actually leads you towards nemesis it leads you towards disaster even though you're not actually doing anything wrong or immoral and with oedipus it's the desperation to know everything i need to know i need to know and it's his wife 
No spoilers. It's his wife who is saying to him, you don't need to know everything, Oedipus. You don't need to know everything. And that's what I referred to earlier when I was referencing Oedipus. So I, I owe you a deep and profound apology for that appalling misrepresentation of, I suppose, originally the work of Sophocles. But I have to tell you, this updated version that's at the Wyndham's Theatre at the moment, I see a lot of plays. I'm very blessed. I get invited to watch plays. And that is just incredible. There were people in the audience who don't know the story. I'm not going to tell you any more than that. No spoilers, because you might not know the story. To watch a play that is over 2,000 years old and hear people gasping in shock at plot developments is a frankly extraordinary achievement. And the performances of, of Mark Strong as Oedipus and Leslie Manville as Jocasta among the finest that I've ever seen. And to be honest with you, I think some of the people screaming knew the story anyway. Um, like Eleanor, the producer of this programme, who was making a lot of noise in, in, by, by about the middle of Act 2. 11.52 is the time. Back to school. Would you take time off school to go on holiday? Would you take time off school to go to the theatre without permission and suck up the £80 fine? Claire's in Swansea. Claire, what would you like to say? Oh, hi. Um, sorry. I'm working from home. Just, uh, I was miles away. Um, uh, it's my I fault that I just went off sorry. on a flight of fancy, Claire. I do apologise. I should have given you no. more warning. Let's do it again. No. You read? No, you relax. I'll come back to you in a minute. <laughs> you were making me chuckle. No, I'm fine, honestly. All right, um, I was boots. ringing um, on behalf of my sister, who has worked in school over 20 years. Um, has a family of her own, you know, low income. Uh, teachers are not paid brilliant salaries, and certainly weren't when she started out. Um, she's she's never been able to take time off during term. She's never been able to sort of say to her husband, oh, here's a cheap holiday in the middle of October. Should we just go and, no. you know, book it? Um, but two wrongs don't make a right, though. Just because your sister no, can't do it doesn't mean that you shouldn't be able to. No, 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 no. But her contract is with the school, with the local authority, That's that true. she's employed to work these hours. So she yes. has, all right, she does have term time holidays that she is paid for, I guess, you know, for want of a better word. But... Yes. She is limited then to take her family holiday during those times when the pay, when the prices are then far more higher than so what they a, are. So there's a there's a double affront to the yes. idea that the parents that the children she teaches can go. Yes. But um but she her, can't. Her, her kids can't. Her kids can't go and have a um a, what was it um a, an experience in what was that, what was that place? Machu Picchu or something? Machu Picchu, the Yucatan yeah, Peninsula. Right. You can pick. You can pick you, the you educational know, destination of your choice, Claire. They could have gone. They could have okay. gone. Well, they could have yeah. gone to the beaches at Normandy, couldn't they? And then, yeah, the, then, the, the, then the conversation I mean, might she, swing a bit yeah, again. You know, exactly. it might shift a bit. Again. Yes. Exactly. Her kids didn't have the 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 option of going out of school time to have those important experiences. So, you know, yes, I do see that there are benefits of those cultural experiences but they should be a benefit for all so they can't just be a benefit for some to save money and then teachers who are what would we do to work those hours what would we do make it a 500 pound fine and you just if you really uh, really really want to nip it in the bud you need to have a slightly more uh comprehensive application scheme for permission to take children away when it is deemed necessary or or, or particularly fruitful and then for the children, for the parents who ride roughshod over that, you find them five hundred pounds. It has to end up costing more to go on holiday during term time than it does to go on holiday during the holidays. Well, can't we can't we ask the holiday companies to play fair? <laughs> Do me a flavour. It's like asking Oasis <laughs> to keep their ticket prices low. <laughs> But it is, though, isn't it? I mean, that's... That, that's we need to get Paul answer, Heaton. We need to get Paul Heaton to take over ABTA, <laughs> yeah. the lead singer yeah. of... Uh, well, he's not the lead singer of anything anymore. He's a solo artist, but the lead singer previously of the House Martins and the Beautiful South. Right, He's poetic when it comes to the importance of keeping ticket costs down. And that means that he is denying himself more money than he would otherwise get, which is why I think he's so fantastic. But the idea of holiday companies doing that is, as we both know, Claire, fanciful to say the least. PMQs is on the way. I should have mentioned that soon. It is Wednesday, which means that at 12 o'clock today, there will be, um, uh, 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 well, uh, uh, events unfolding between Keir Starmer and Rishi Sunak. After that, uh, I, I got a remarkable email off a remarkable woman who I have crossed paths with before when we were talking to, I don't know if you heard it, we were talking to a young man in Israel, Maoz, uh, M-A-O-Z, who lost his parents on October the 7th and has subsequently become 
a tireless campaigner for peace and reconciliation. He recognises what seems to be lost to so many in this conversation. He recognises that the only prospect of peace comes from reconciliation, comes from um, recognition of the pain on both sides and the absence of a hierarchy of humanity. And I, I, I got a message from a young woman who knows more about that than you would wish upon your worst enemy. And she was keen to come on the programme. And there is a, a particular anniversary this week that we will mark uh, a little belatedly by inviting her onto the programme today. I wonder if you can put that jigsaw together. And then there's a headline in the Times today talking about, uh, it, it literally says, and it struck me as quite a moment in reporting of matters Middle East and for Rupert Murdoch's time to carry the headline, this is monstrous, in quotes, babies among 23 dead in attack on Lebanon. So given that journalists can get in and out of Lebanon currently with relative ease, uh, as opposed to Gaza, I thought we'd catch up with that journalist in Beirut uh, a, a little later today as well. But before all of that, PMQs, and before all of that, Natasha Clark, James what do O'Brien. we think? What Hi. do we think is, is? Have you ever met Taylor Swift? Uh, no, no. I have gone to see Taylor Swift though. Same. What about? I've seen her more than you have. Actually, I've only seen her once. Okay. How many times I have, have you seen her? her? More than you, three times. Three. That's a super fan. And I could have seen her four times. Okay. But I went. I didn't go to see the 1975 because I'm a, a, a crashing bore. And I had gone as a guest. I can't whisper that. Oh, I'd okay. gone as a guest of, oh, okay. of Matty Healy. On, so I'd got the whole Oh, my gosh. BIP. You're really there. He's also been on full disclosure. That's four today. Four full disclosure people. And Keir Starmer with five full disclosure. <laughs> five full disclosure people today we've mentioned just in passing. So and you're then best the friends with Matty Healy? He, he used to ring into the show a lot. He's been on full disclosure. That's amazing. He's a busy man. But he, so we went along. We had the full experience. And then the girls wanted to go. Ah. Oh. And we had to pay and it was late. So we bought tickets. And I, in yeah. the end, I didn't go. Oh. So they went with someone else. I went with their mum and a friend. And Taylor came on stage as the surprise guest. Oh, my God. That's so amazing. I, I know. And I missed it because I'm an idiot. You're I'm so an silly. idiot. I'm a VIP idiot. That's so what silly. I am. So what's silly. coming up in PMQ? From VIP to PMQ, what's coming up oh, today? What a, what a segue. That was lovely. Um, look, I think the news that inflation has fallen today will be a topic for both sides, right? If you're Rishi Senate, you can say this is all down to me. This is all down to... Nah, 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 no, you can't. Well, he can. No, he can't. He can and he won't. No, he can't and he won't. He can and he will. Because when it went up, he insisted it had Ah. absolutely nothing to do with his government. Yes, and then when it went down, he went, it's all to do with my government and all the decisions that I'm taking. So they're going to argue. Yeah, and then Keir Starmer will go, it's all about me, I think. It's all about me. Yeah, exactly. So I think that will come up. Obviously, this is the second to last week before the budget. So I'm sure that's going to come up. And all the headlines and all the papers today about this 22 billion back hole, which now has doubled apparently Mm. to 40 billion pounds. And to be fair, Rachel Reeves has been talking about this for ages, saying that £22 billion is just enough to keep public services staying still. And she's saying that she now wants to borrow more to invest. It seems really likely she's going to tweak the fiscal rules to allow her to borrow more cap- to, to invest in capital going forward for the future. Um, but obviously, what's that going to mean for us? Is it going to mean tax rises? Where are you going to cut those budgets? All these questions floating around ahead of the budget. I'm sure Rishi Sunak, obviously, he's been on the other side of it, right? As a former chancellor, he as a former prime minister, he is well used to the leader of the opposition trying to get a little bit of a dig in before the budget. And I wonder if he might use his second to last or third to last prime minister's questions to sort of needle him a little bit on this one. Mm, we shall see. I have to give a quick mention to Nick, who, who just heard his dad, Robin Bracknell, say on the radio that he's now officially retired. Apparently, Nick's mum, Rob's wife, thinks that he's still considering the prospect of going back to work. So he's And taking, how, how old is he if he's, he's, taken he's quite, retired? Quite, well, he's a teacher, so he, he would have, he'd, have done his, he'd have done his shift as well. Nick also breaches familial confidentiality to reveal what his hobbies are. He says it's just gardening and walking the dog, James. That's, 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 it's funny Sounds that we like were talking about Oedipus earlier. Talk about filial disloyalty. This is, this is just extraordinary. Um, anything controversial, do you think? I mean, he's not sought to make hay out of these in my view, largely confected stories about Keir Starmer not breaking any rules, being somehow held up as proof that he's as bad as politicians who did break rules when it comes to declaring hospitality and declaring gifts. Mm. It's Taylor Swift stories, even on the front page of the Times today. Um, Sunak thus far has avoided this Well, Taylor, uh, Rishi Sunak is a huge Swifty, and I don't know if he saw him at the last era's Mm. tour, but I wouldn't be surprised if Rishi Sunak had taken his own 
hospitality ticket to, to go and see Ta- Taylor Swift or, or, or other um, pop stars in his time. So it's a bit of a tricky one, right? The problem that Keir Starmer has, obviously, is that he's trying to differentiate himself from the last guy. And that's, really, tr- that's really quite tricky to do. So what they should have done is not just refuse to break rules that exist, but they should have uh, aspired not to break rules that don't exist. Yeah, and to, to be better, right? If they had come in after this whole freebie storm uh, had started and just said, look, we I totally agree, the rules are not fit for purpose. Let's have a look at them. Yeah. I will rip them up and I'll be better than the last guys because that's what I promised. I think you should have done I mean, that a long trick, time ago. It's, well, it's a little unfair to say you should have realised that you had to obey rules that don't exist. Well, exactly. And, you in know, order to dif- differentiate yourself from the people who break rules that do exist, all you have to do is break rules that don't break rules that do exist. But you're right. It feels well, how much of it is a media creation how much of it is public opinion, how much of it is a combination of both, they should have pledged to abide by rules that don't exist. Yeah, and they have said now that they are going to change the rules to mean that ministers and MPs will have to declare things in the same way. So I'm sure we will see a bit more of that when they do review those rules. And I just think it was a, a bit of an open goal, uh, and a, sorry, an own goal for, for Keir Starmer no. not to have, have done something more on this earlier. It's so will easy. Sunak bring it up? Can he bring it up? I mean, I mean he, he can. Ha- he can be quite opportunistic. He has, and he's spoken, you know, we've had lots of jokes about Lord Alley and the glasses and the free, the joke you know, that. jokes before. Would he do that again? Potentially, it feels like it's maybe not... Uh, uh, the, the top of his agenda, I reckon, if he wants to go on something, it will be the economy. But if he wants to make a joke on it, there's a, I'm sure there is a Taylor Swift-related joke to be made here. It is um, obviously the moment in the week where I remind you that at some point in the next couple of minutes, Rishi Sunak will get to his feet and start asking questions of the Prime Minister, Sir, Sir Keir Starmer, at which point we will cross immediately to the House of Commons to find out what, what transpires. Um There hasn't been, I mean, it's partly because the personnel is the same, but the energy and the dynamic of PMQs hasn't changed much, even as they swap jobs. Yeah, but last week we did see a bit of a stepping up from Keir Starmer, didn't we? We saw that he'd um, sort of, yeah, uh, got a little bit more fire in his belly as he sought to, like, fight back after the sort of slight dampener on the hun- fast 100 days um, and you know there are other things that Rishi Sunak could go on the P&O row obviously came at the end of last week he's not talked about that the workers rights well, package was, the business summit the mollified and the, the business summit is generally regarded to have gone quite well I think yeah it's gone I think it's gone alright but mm. I think you know speaking to some of the businesses in the room there was a little bit of an error of apprehension and this national insurance stuff you know Rachel Reeves has mm. described uh, hiking taxes on national insurance on employers as essentially a tax on workers by the back door before I sh- wouldn't be surprised if Rishi Sunak wanted to throw that back in her face uh, in the, de- the week before the budget saying this is something that we looks like it's going to be in the budget doesn't it it looks like it they're no, definitely uh, not ruling it out and, and, and yet of course they will answer Starmer will say we're mm. not going to discuss anything that's in the budget mm. potentially or otherwise yep. until we actually announce and the of budget. course that cut to national insurance that Rishi Sunak himself did we're, we're told according to some of the paper reports that that could be back on the table as well to save the Chancellor some money. There are reports today that Jaron Jones, the Chief Secretary to the Treasury, is ruling that out. So that would obviously would be a tax rise for workers if they were to reverse that cut to national insurance. And something that Rachel Reeves told Cabinet yesterday of her priorities for this budget is that she is going to protect the workers and look to invest in the NHS. So I think that's what we can expect to see in the budget in a couple of weeks. Any rabbits? Anything that Rishi Sunak might pull out of the hat and surprise Keir Starmer with? Although I suppose by definition if you can predict it now it will cease to be a rabbit, won't it? It will. At the moment of mention. Um, Today the Conservatives have just put out something in their sort of last Last hour or so about the reopening of asylum hotels. Oh yes, and that's been something that, of course, Rishi Sunak, um, you know, made such there a. There we huge go. Pr- Let's find out. Uh, can I join with the Prime Minister's words of tribute to Alex Salmond and the Holocaust survivor Lily Ebert, and thank him for his kind words about Sir David Amos? Uh, we remember him fondly, and we will be thinking of all their families uh, at this moment. Uh, Mr. Speaker, this week China has carried out unwarranted, aggressive, and intimidatory military exercises in the Taiwan Strait. Our allies are rightly concerned. After worrying reports that the government may have intervened to stop a visit to the UK by the former Taiwanese president, can the Prime Minister confirm that the Foreign Secretary will use his meetings in Beijing this week to condemn China's dangerous escalatory acts in the Strait? Uh, I thank him for his question. The, The continued military activity in the Strait is not conducive to peace and stability, and stability in the Taiwan Straits is in all of our interest. On the wider point that he 
uh, raises, we will uh, cooperate where we can as permanent members of the UN Security Council, issues like net zero, health and trade, compete where we have different interests, but challenge the point he makes is absolutely right where it's needed to protect national security, human rights and our values, and we will put that challenge in. Well, uh, given what the Prime Minister said, and I agree, of course, we, we must engage, but we should use that engagement for our national interests. I hope that the Foreign Secretary will unequivocally condemn yes. this military escalation and stand up for democracy in Taiwan. Now, the whole House will be concerned about the fate of the democracy campaigner, Jimmy Lai. He is a British citizen who has been wrongly imprisoned in Hong Kong for four years. The previous government pressured China for his release. Does the Prime Minister agree that this is a politically motivated prosecution and that it is a breach of China's legal obligations to Hong Kong under the Sino-British Declaration? Yes, and uh, this case, as he will understand, is a priority for the government. Um, we do call on the Hong Kong authorities to release immediately our British national, and the Foreign Secretary raised this case in his first meeting with China's Foreign Minister, and we will continue to do so. I thank the Prime Minister for that answer. Now, China, as he knows, has become a decisive enabler of Russia's war against Ukraine, supplying the vast majority now of Russia's imported military microelectronics and components, worsening the suffering of the Ukrainian people. So can the Prime Minister confirm that he is prepared to sanction any Chinese business or individual involved in aiding Russia's invasion of Ukraine, including secondary sanctions on financial institutions? Yes, and we've called for that in the past. We continue to do so. And I hope this is an issue where we can have unity across the House. Yes, I can uh, assure the Prime Minister of his support. It is something that we began. The United States recently have expanded their sanctions, and I hope that the new government will continue uh, to look at doing the same. Now, the last government also established a new system of registration and monitoring to protect the UK from interference from foreign states, including China, Russia and Iran. Called the Foreign Influence Registration Scheme, it was described as essential by MI5 in the fight to help keep Britain safe. But since the Prime Minister took office, he has halted its implementation. Why? That isn't correct. Mr Speaker, that is very clearly what the government has said. And only last week he said at the dispatch box that he would give the security forces the powers they need. And if he is going to fulfil that promise, I would urge him to get up to speed on this issue and therefore implement the scheme. Parliament's, Parliament's, furthermore, Parliament's Intelligence and Security Committee have warned that British universities are increasingly a rich feeding ground for China to exert political influence over us. That's why, that's why we passed the Freedom of Speech Act with new powers, with new powers to help defend universities from this threat, but the new Education Secretary has since blocked it. So can the Prime Minister tell us how, without this tool, the government will prevent Chinese influence over our universities? I, I really don't think party political points on security... Throughout the last Parliament, we stood with the government on all questions of security and intelligence because it was important to the outside world that we did so. I worked with the security and intelligence services for five years prosecuting cases. I know firsthand the work that they do as a lawyer. I've known firsthand the work they do as the Prime Minister. We support them in everything that we do, and he knows that. Mr Speaker, whether it's the first scheme or the Freedom of Speech Act, these were new tools, new sets of powers that the previous government passed in order to give, whether it's our universities or security services, the powers they need to tackle a growing threat. And we will, of course, continue to support the government in protecting our national security, but do believe on this side of the House that those tools are needed and are concerned by reports that the new government has paused their implementation or indeed scrapped them. But finally, Mr Speaker, The Chinese government has sanctioned multiple members of our parliament for championing human rights. 
As a result, they have faced intimidation, abuse and surveillance. And Mr Speaker, I commend you for your defence of the right of every member of this House to speak out on crucial issues without fear of retaliation from foreign states. Now, I know the Prime Minister will agree with that too. So this week, will the Foreign Secretary in his meetings not just raise the issue, but tell the Chinese government to lift those sanctions on our colleagues? Uh, yes, and uh, we speak with one voice. He speaks uh, about the record of the last government. That record was 14 years of failure. Six years, six years of austerity, three years of Brexit logjam, then Johnson Trust and the Leader of the Opposition utter failure. And this government was elected to do things differently, to make fairer choices, but most importantly to give Britain its future back. So we will fix the foundations, we will do it with a long-term plan to grow our economy, protect working people and rebuild our country. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Two years ago, Thurrock Council was led into effective bankruptcy by the then Conservative administration, in no small part due to an investment of hundreds of millions of pounds into a solar farm scheme run by a con man. Given the Prime Minister's commitment to integrity and public life, will he support mine and my constituents' calls for a public inquiry so that those responsible can finally be held to account? Yeah. I thank her for her question because years of underfunding have left councils facing huge budget pressures. They yawn, they, they don't know the impact it has on working people up and down the country. They rely on public services, and what's happened in Thurrock is shocking. We are committed to resetting the relationship and helping those under intervention to recover and to reform. 14 years is a long time to destroy local services, and it's clear it will take time to fix them. We will get councils back on their feet by providing multi-year funding settlements. But ultimately, we have to grow our economy, and I'm surprised the Prime Minister didn't welcome the £63 billion of investment that we were able to announce on Monday. Leader of the Liberal Democrats, Sir Ed Davies. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I echo the tributes of the Prime Minister to Alex Salmon, to Sir David uh, Amos, and to Lee Ebbett? And can I welcome the news that ministers are going to review the carers' allowance repayment scandal uh, after campaigns by carers' organisations, the Guardian newspaper, and the Liberal Democrats, culminating in our motion on the order paper today? But will he agree with me that the evidence needed for the review is already long established and many of the decisions self-evident? So we, will he and his colleagues vote for our motion today so we can write off the overpayments, we can end the crazy cliff edge to the earnings limit now and have a fuller review for the support that carers deserve? Yeah. Yeah. I, I thank him for raising this. This is obviously a really important issue affecting uh, a number of um, people um, and that's why we've launched an independent review uh, into the carers allowance overpayments to look at the circumstances of the overpayments to see what went wrong and therefore what can be done to put it right because carers must get the support that they deserve so I'm grateful for him for raising it I'm glad that we've been able to take this action today to to go forward on a really important issue and David can I thank the Prime Minister for that uh, answer and ask him that ministers in the review will listen to the voices of carers uh, throughout. Can I turn to the Middle East now? Israeli Finance Minister Smotrich had said that starving two million people in Gaza might be justified and moral. National Security Minister Ben Gavir called settlers who killed a 19-year-old on the West Bank heroes. After my visit to Israel and Palestine last February, having witnessed the damage that these extremist ministers in the Netanyahu, Netanyahu government are doing, I called on the last government to sanction them. The last government refused, but we now learn that the former Foreign Secretary was considering this. So will the Prime Minister now sanction the ministers Ben Gavir and Smotrich? Yeah. We are looking at that because they're obviously abhorrent comments, as he rightly says, along with other uh, really concerning activity in the West Bank, um, but also uh, across the region. The humanitarian situation in Gaza is dire. 
Uh, the death toll has surpassed 42,000, and access to basic services is becoming much harder. And Israel must take all possible steps to avoid civilian casualties, to allow aid into Gaza in much greater volume, and provide the UN and humanitarian partners the ability to operate uh, effectively. Uh, uh, Mr Speaker, uh, along with France, the UK will convene an urgent meeting of the UN Security Council to address this. Mary Lyndon. Thank you, Mr Speaker. It's been an honour to meet my constituent, Tom Morton, a young person And it is six minutes after 12. Quite a lot to talk about there, although not necessarily the things that we were expecting to be picking over. I don't just mean in terms of topic selection by... Rishi Sunak, who Keir Starmer persists in calling the Prime Minister. I wonder when that ceases to be a forgive. Might have already crossed the point where it ceases to be a forgivable oversight and, and becomes something of a millstone. But but also in terms of tone and delivery, um, we shall uh, run it under Natasha Clark's nose after this. James O'Brien on LBC. It's 19 minutes after 12 and you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC where I think we just witnessed a rather strange PMQs. It's divided opinion, although I suppose PMQs always does. Marion writes, all this sensibleness is almost bizarre. That was eight minutes in, so not necessarily the case that the sensibleness was sustained, Marion, but I do, I really take your point. Becky, meanwhile, asks, what is going on? at PMQs today, which is similar to the position that Natasha and I found ourselves in um, while listening to it. And and Callum says, Starmer really does like his yes-no answers, doesn't he? It's quite refreshing. And that idea of him simply saying that is not the case or that is not true and sitting down again. I can't remember the last mm. time I saw something like that at PMQs. There was something odd about We talked about energy and dynamics, didn't we, before it opened. I've never quite seen an energy like that before at PMQs. Yeah, it's odd. And if you, you know, if, if you're Rishi Sunak and you might be thinking about your legacy building in your final Prime Minister's questions yes. before you step down... This wouldn't be like China is not something I feel that he would go back and say I'm I'm particularly strong on. Um, it's not exactly a record that I think. Yeah, he's he's got a lot to say on, but nonetheless, um, quite a lot of probing questions about sort of what the government's attitude to China was. Um, we're told that David Lammy is expected to to go to China potentially next week. Rachel Reeves planning a visit next year. I can't help feeling though that I think Rishi Sunak missed a few you know open goals there really to talk about you know, taxes, winter fuel, um, the budget, national insurance, inflation, some of the things that I think he would be on the, on the front foot on. But he clearly, you know... Could it be, and I'm just spitballing here, but could it be that he is? these are the issues that he thinks are really important rather than the issues that are going to get the loudest cheers from his backbenchers? Now that he's on the home straight, he thinks China is a really big deal. Mm. And he worries that Labour, like plenty of members of previous Conservative administrations are not and again I said nice things about Gavin Williamson earlier I'm now about to say something nice about Ian Duncan Smith gosh are you feeling alright well you can rewind on Global Player but Duncan Smith has kind of led the field of being very very robust and clear on China up to and including the case of Jimmy Lai um, maybe Sunak is persuaded that this is where the national interest lies or at least where the national Her Majesty's, His Majesty's opposition should be highlighting the national interest it could be not mysterious at all potentially but mm. you'd like to i if you know in, in a political sense and you know that's this is what people say when they say that maybe rishi senate wasn't as political as he could have been you know if if i were in his team advising him i might say well actually prime minister sorry former prime minister i've just done what you um just berated Keir Starmer for doing um rishi Sunak, you know you have this legacy on ukraine like why would you not think that was a stronger topic to go on if you want to go on a foreign I issue of, of a sort of unity um, with a lot of cross-party consensus. Why not go on that? But he's he's clearly looking for something to slightly wrong-foot Keir Starmer on. And I think it's fair to say that Keir Starmer was caught a little bit on the back foot there. He had no answers prepared on, on really anything, apart from that one critical question, mm. which they did start with, uh, talking about this new system of registration for foreign influence on states, which Rishi Sunak seemed adamant that the government had at least paused yes, or potentially strange, scrapped. Keir Starmer said, no, absolutely not the case. Well, the truth will out probably in the course of the next 20 minutes, actually. Um, speaking about dividing opinion, Paul writes, I like Keir's answering technique. It's brilliant, direct and good to see. While Fraser writes, you just heard what a rabbit in the headlights sounds like. Starmer unsure and flat-footed. Poor answers to Suno. I'm a Starmer supporter. He must do better. He sounded... Unprepared. They can both he was unprepared be, they on can that both issue. Be right, actually, can't they? I mean, he's, yes, he was unprepared on that issue because he doesn't really think it's an issue. I think. No, and you know, there, you know, answers are 
forthcoming on on China. I think for for the Labour Party, it was it's very clear that they have wanted to to shift the government's position on it. You know, I, don't, I didn't see people like David Cameron getting ready to to prepare to fly to China in six months ago. This is a definite shift in the yes. government's position. Um, the Labour position is that they want to collaborate with China on things like trade, on things like climate change, but insisting that they are clear eyed on the risks that China. Pose and you know I was uh, and the atrocities that China has committed. Of course, it, it kind of takes a little bit of the stuffing out of the again the strongish, stronger words on Israel. Massive respect to Ed Davey for bringing the fascists Smotrich and Ben Gavir into the conversation. Yeah, um, and a little bit of news that, that Keir Starmer is considering sanctioning against those them individually, those which individual. is something that Cameron supposedly had in his in his in his outray when he was at the Foreign Office. There, also, the question of sanctions in 30 days if if that more is not done to get aid into Gaza coming coming from America a, a sense of the um uh, the, the 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 crumbling of traditional support for every single thing that Benjamin Netanyahu undertakes in the name of the Israeli people but some people worried of course about the time scale um yet yeah, I, I I I'd steer back to Jimmy Lai who who uh, whose case I followed quite closely uh, and I know his son Sebastian who was in the studio with us just last week, I don't think, and Sebastian has to be incredibly careful what he says because of um, members of his family who aren't currently banged up in solitary confinement while being desperately ill, like like his dad is. Uh, but I know that his lawyer, Keenan Gallagher, has come out a little more strongly against David Lammy's perceived inaction on this than they did when they were in the studio with me. I don't think that Keenan would be particularly impressed by Starmer's answer to that question. To, no. to the answer to the question, well, we will raise this and we will raise that, because really what, what you do if a British citizen is being held um, after a, a meaningless legal process by a, a deeply oppressive regime, you, you don't do business with them until your man's been released. Yeah, but they're saying that's exactly what they're, you know, mm. like I say, talking about doing trade with, with China and the idea that the Chancellor could be flying out to, to China next year uh, will obviously be be not good news to to the family of Jimmy Lai, and you know Starwa called it politically motivated. He did say that um, it is you know Ch uh, China's behaviour is not conducive to peace and stability in the region, and we've seen what's happened with Taiwan mm. uh, and the Straits and, and the exercises that China is doing this week, which Taiwan have condemned. Um, but you know he was asked directly by Rishi Sunak, "Will you condemn this aggression?" He wouldn't repeat that word. So I think you know a, a light criticism, I think, from Keir Starmer are on that one. Um, which which will, I think, not please some of the, the Tory backbenchers, not least the ones that are sanctioned by China, those five of our own MPs that, that were sanctioned by China. In, under, under including Ian Duncan-Smith, I think. Ian Duncan-Smith. Yes. Um, uh, it's almost like grown up, says Lee and Romford. Um, uh, uh, but actually some support for that suggestion that Sunak may now be dealing with the things that he cares about rather than, uh, someone put it rather beautifully, Anthony says, oh, that's it, James. Sunak is showing that he is a statesman. He's not going to go down in a flurry of fur and feathers well, he's like had, Boris Johnson did. He's it's had a not couple of years to talk about China well, if that's precisely. what he wanted to talk about. It's not really something to, to discuss and bring up at your last but three pit Prime Minister's questions. And here's really. a question for Natasha Clark. So uh -oh. Mark Butler writes, won't, it won't be long before the new Tory leader makes it all a circus again. Well, that's right. We are in this weird in-between phase and, and someone described it very neatly to me the other day. We're still in the trailer period for uh, for this new Keir Starmer government and the film's not yet begun. We haven't yet had that budget and until we do, we feel, until we get that budget, until we get a new Tory leader, this is all just a bit of, you know... Yes. Window dressing in a so way, right? Budget plus new Tory leader. Yeah, it's going to be a really big week. I the, think the, the, for, the kind of second wind of, yeah, of already a huge quite, reset for British politics will happen once we have those two things in place. Do you have any insight into who is likely to be the next Tory leader? What are we thinking? What do, what do we know? The polls of Tory members, of which mm. there have been a very few, and they're incredibly small sample size. So I really don't think we can we can trust them that much. Right. Say that it's Kemi Badenoch uh, will be in the in the, in the running. Not a lot. So the last Sky poll had a, had Robert Jenrick closing up that gap. I wouldn't be surprised if Robert Jenrick does a little bit better. And he has been touring a lot more constituency associations, as far as I can see, f pressing a lot more flesh, doing a lot more media interviews as well, which we've talked about with, with Kemi Badenoch's yes. slight reluctance to do. Um, doesn't before. seem to like journalists. She doesn't, I don't think. I think that's that's a fair accusation. <laughs> Some of my best friends are journalists. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely shocking attitude. Oh, she's, uh, of course, welcome piece. to come on anytime on LBC. Um, I think it was John Harris. No, John Crace, I think. In the, in the Guardian writing about her tactic seems to be to, to just stay quiet now well, and, let, if she and is let Robert Jenrick go out there and lose support by showing people what he's like. If, if she is indeed ahead 
as some of these polls mm. predict, then why would you not? If you're the front runner, you you have to let the other guys lose. Um, but Robert Jenrick, I think, is is fair to say is just doing everything under the sun. And arguably, we saw that with the the supposed cleverly surge. Yes or no? Yes, we did. Um, do know, we know anything more about that? Is it? Do you think it's likely that James Cleverly's people either arranged? from above someone else encouraged them to do it or they took it enough of them took it upon themselves to try to get Jenrick into the second round because they thought he'd be easier to beat than Badenoch and yep. therefore they ended up accidentally giving him enough votes to beat cleverly do we think that's what's I happened I think yeah it's bang on and I think really? that's completely what happened I what think they really messed it up lumps, exactly yes. and yeah and I don't think it was sanctioned from the top because otherwise I think they would have been counting the numbers a lot more carefully and they absolutely royally messed it all up for themselves and, and completely shot themselves in the foot never underestimate the Tory party's ability to destroy itself. Do you know which Daily Mail columnist today became the first to make their choice public? Sarah Vine. I actually have read this before you flashed it across and Do me. you know what her <laughs> choice was? It's Kemi Badenoch. The human tornado. A human, I mean, that's, that's an accurate Do you know why this is a poison chalice of sorts, just in the stand first written under above the headline? I skimmed it. I'm so sorry I didn't so read it in Sarah too much Vine detail. Sarah Vine writes, yes, she makes gaffes. Yes, she gets up people's noses. It, it's not what you... I mean, given that Kemi Badenoch recently gave an interview in which she very graciously explained why she never has to apologise for anything because she never actually makes any yep. gaffes, it's a little odd for one of her self-appointed cheerleaders in, in the uh, Daily Mail universe to describe her as, as if making gaffes is the first thing that people associate her with. It's a bold strategy. <laughs> no wonder she doesn't like journalists with friends like this. Right. It's a, it's a bold strategy. A bold strategy. And this very is nice. exactly... Like Francis well, Oh. Sir Humphrey, no, you sound like Sir Humphrey. It's a very bold strategy, a Prime, very Minister. Bold strategy Prime Minister. <laughs> but look, I th it is a choice that Tory members are going to have, right? Do you oh. want this bull in a china shop, Kemi Badenoch? Human tornado, please. Human tornado of Kemi Badenoch. Or do you want the slightly... S is it fair to describe Robert Jenrick as a slightly safer pair of hands? Is that fair? Slimy. Slightly safer no, pair of hands no, it's than Kemi Badenoch. slimy. I don't know about slimy. Uh, well, you mean he's less word. like... Well, if you don't believe in anything... You then be... you can kind of mould yourself into whatever you think is necessary in that moment. If you don't believe in anything, you're a lot less likely to break bull China in shops. Yeah, because you can just you can just you know slime tornado around, the around them, slime, slime around slime them, slime around them, like the green character in Ghostbusters that Keith will now remind me of the name. Slimer. Slimer. Thank you very much. It's <laughs> half past 12. Um, Lucinda Horsley's here now with your headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. 34 is the time you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Do you know, we mentioned Jimmy Lai a moment ago because uh, Rishi Sunak raised it at PMQs. I, I have to tell you that the treatment of Imran Khan in jail in Pakistan at the moment is... Also uh, pretty chilling, pretty terrifying, something that his former wife Jemima Khan is doing her very best. Jemima Goldsmith, of course, as, as, as she is now doing her absolute very best to draw more attention to. And we will be helping with that mission um, a, a little bit later this week. But some of the treatment apparently being visited upon Imran Khan is, uh, well, ob obviously inhuman. And it was to inhumanity that we turned our attention, man's inhumanity to man for, for Larkin fans, that we turned our attention um, uh, on October the 7th, in fact, of this year, when we spoke to Maus Inan, uh, an Israeli entrepreneur who has become in recent months or in the last 12 months has become a tireless peace activist, a job that seems to some people a little surprising when you learn that both of his parents were killed in the terror attack on the kibbutz where the where his family lived in Israel on October the 7th I got more messages about Mao's more people asking me to pass on their profound admiration of and support for Mao's that than I um than I do for uh, many guests, but but one stuck out. Someone I've, I've I've already spoken to and been in contact with. But for Joe Berry, who joins me in the studio now, it was a particularly mm. poignant exchange. Joe, why? Yes, because I resonate so deeply with his message, and his message is not one that we're hearing. And the way that you received it with such sensitivity and depth, it just made me feel this was the place where I need to share what I'm doing and why. Because reconciliation between apparently intractable yeah. people mm -hmm. is something to which you've dedicated a significant portion of your life. Yes, and also the idea of, of shared humanity, that an enemy is someone whose story we haven't heard, and to move beyond the idea of us and them and stop the othering 
And that's what my journey has been. And I've just marked 40 years since my father was blown up in a terrorist attack um, at the Grand Hotel in Brighton. Um, and I actually dedicated my life just two days later to not having an enemy and creating something positive out of it. To, to a point where even Mao's may be slightly awed by the, 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 the progress that you've made in that process mm. because, of course, um, you have become an ally of Patrick McGee, uh, a for, former IRA terrorist, freed under the terms of the Good Friday Agreement and mm -hmm. your father's killer. Yes. Can we, yes. let me listen, <laughs> let me let people hear Patrick McGee describe the moment that he met you. She wasn't hitting me over the head with it. This is the man you killed. She was just explaining something about her loss. And then in my head, something clicked, it says, I killed this guy, you know, um, who at some level, many levels, had created this woman, you know, and that's, that's shattering. That realization, at some level, I'd reduced him to all he stands for, to the point where he's this cipher who, you know, you can take this action against. That's, I had been reduced. Hmm. Um, two days I, I mean we mentioned anniversaries you, you, you mentioned the 40th anniversary it was on Saturday the 12th of October Mao's mm. was obviously marking the first anniversary of the of the attack upon upon Israel but but, but two days after losing yeah. your father you embarked what happened yeah. inside you that made you resolve to do that it was the how it happened I didn't just lose my dad but I lost the me that lived in peacetime the me that didn't have an enemy and the how, it almost like my heart was open to reality of war. Um, and what do I do with that level of pain and trauma? The only way was to turn it around and bring something positive and somehow contribute to peace. And at 27, I didn't know how, but I had the intention, the purpose. And that journey started, which um, has been incredible There's so much so serendipity and, and incredible moments. And when Patrick McGee came out of prison, because of the peace process, mm. that's when I thought it's time to meet him. It, it, I should mention that, that um, 34 people were injured that day. As you say, um, yeah. four, four others died. And of course, the, the plan was to kill Margaret Thatcher. Yeah. That was the overarching yeah. plan that McGee and his, and his colleagues had. What would your father have made? I hope this isn't an inappropriate question. What would Sir Anthony Berry have thought of the idea of reconciliation in the way that you have successfully pursued it in your life? Yeah. Well, I don't know, but he always <laughs> took great pains to try to understand me because as a young person, I was following rather a different route in life and it was very important for him to understand all his six children. So I, I think he would have known that I would have done something slightly different mm. and he was such an accepting person um, and he himself when when he was killed he had loads of friends in labor as well as conservative so i mean i hope you'll understand if this this isn't about changing what happened to us and many other people and of course you know i know many people affected in northern ireland from the conflict from all sides you know we can't change that but can we learn to change the future and that's that's what motivates me every day so people don't go through that kind of pain when you hear conversations on programs like this about mm. the situation currently unfolding in Middle East, in, in yeah. the Middle East, and you hear the opposite of what you and males represent, that idea of, mm. and, and I, I don't want to oversimplify, but when you essentially know that people on both, quote, sides, end quotes, believe yeah. that the only viable resolution is the eradication of yeah. the other side, how does that yeah, make yeah. you feel? It literally breaks my heart because that's not how we're going to get peace. Anywhere, it, ever. Ever, exactly. <laughs> the only way is to hear the pain of each side, is to recognise there's humanity, and it's that rehumanization that's so important. You know, I have friends in Gaza, I have friends in Israel, I have friends in Lebanon, you know, and I equally care about all of them. And I think just as human beings, we we can destroy each other. I also think we can really see the humanity in, in others but does require like inner inner work inner shift 
to because that need for revenge and blame is so strong as human beings and and what i mean how often do you encounter that shift happen because you say for you it was almost mm. an organic blooming within yeah. two days of your terrible loss you mm. knew what you wanted to do i think for males in on as well yeah, in, in in israel it was so so the real mm. challenge i presume for you and for your charity building bridges for peace mm. is to take the immovable mm. yeah. and make it move mm. yes and you know patrick mcgee would say that he was disarmed by my empathy at that first meeting, not by me arguing that I'm right, you're wrong, because I just don't think that brings change. So I created an opportunity for him to feel safe, to mm. open up, and I think that's what it's about, to listen to people so they really feel heard and acknowledged. And then they change because they choose to, not because I tell them or we tell them. And, of course, e even in your own family, there is not full understanding of the path that you've gone down is there from, no. from, from your siblings as well yeah which is absolutely fine well, I, I mention it only because it highlights that you don't need yeah. me to explain to you how difficult sometimes this this work can be how, yeah how, it's no. almost a natural response is to is to entrench i think yeah i, I know I, absolutely <coughs> and i've met people who are very angry with me who, yes. who think that i betrayed my father and you know i'm not attached to being right about this so i can hear people who have a really different response and and i'm i am interested you know people come if people come to me with a lot of anger and a lot of hurt it's because they've got their story yes yes and and and, and the, i mean you'll be re-exploring some of this territory this evening won't you at the building bridges across across the divide event which, yeah. which sees so that, you sit down with patrick once again i think you've met over 400 times now yeah, we've shared our stories in many places, including Palestine and Israel, about 10, 20 years ago. Gosh. So tonight, um, St. James's Church is the place... In Piccadilly. ...that I yeah, made the decision right. to bring something positive. It was a, a clear moment of just, OK, this is what I need to do. So to go back there with Patrick McGee to share what we've learnt, um, how is it relevant today with amazing facilitation from Marina Cantacuzino from the Forgiveness Project. Um, I think it's going to be an extraordinary event. I'm sure I'm going to be very, very emotional because, you know, the 27-year-old me didn't know this was going to happen 40 years later, didn't know the amazing opportunities I've had to make a difference. What would you say to her? I feel quite proud of her at the moment. Like, she didn't have the how. Emotional intelligence, pretty zero. But there was this absolute dedication... <laughs> You know, and I, I would have said to her, please be kind to yourself. Please, you know, just just take care of yourself because that that was the big aspect of myself I didn't know. And finally, Joe, how do you? I mean, I, I, your story is mm. a beacon of hope in some of the other mm. scenarios that mm. we discuss and describe on the program. But those scenarios and and. Uh, situations persist mm. how do you retain your hope mm. how, how do you retain your confidence that this yeah. work is going to prove fruitful mm. I think hope for me is part of my belief in a more peaceful world in non-violence and there are people I've got an amazing friend in the West Bank in Israel in Palestine who he's the most extraordinary man he just pops up and goes how are you doing and I think of the people who right now have got so much reason to go for revenge and yet are saying no you know I, I'm going to break that cycle I think of my the young people in schools I go to who are extraordinary despite challenges they have uh, they know they're positive change makers you know I am part of an incredible network of people and I just you know I love humanity I, I've just been traveling a lot and everywhere I went I met extraordinary people so I think that that's the hope. It's a strength in company. Yes, I don't feel alone anymore. I have done, but no longer. I'm sure. And there'll, there'll be wonderful <laughs> company tonight as well at um, St. James's Church in Piccadilly. I, I, I don't know if there, if there are any tickets left, are there? Uh, there might be some, a few available on the door, I, I think. Yeah, but, no, um, there's lots. Is there, there's oh, some people church. must get themselves down there then to, yes, to yes. St. James's Church at 197 Piccadilly. If I get a text off that bloke in Wigan accusing me of being London-centric again, I'm going to kick off, Joe, honestly. <laughs> this is where the church <laughs> is. I'm not being London-centric. Okay, well, you, could, you could say that they're also going to be in Belfast just to make it a bit more. There it is. Uh, and, the week after uh, in Belfast. Where, where, do you know what venue you're in in Belfast? Yes, Clonard Monastery. Clonard Monastery. In Belfast next week. Yeah, on on 
Tuesday. So go to the forgivenessproject.com to find out more about this or indeed Building Bridges Across the Divide. Just Google Building either. Bridges for Peace is my charity. Building Bridges for Peace. The Clonard Monastery is, is on that. And that means a lot also speaking in Belfast with Patrick McGee. Of course it know. does. Thank you. Be I very can powerful. understand A, why you were so moved by um, yes. our conversation with Mao's and B, why you felt it would be worth making my listeners more aware of the work that you do and the extraordinary journey that you've been on. So, thank Barry, you. thank you. Thank you. It's 12.46. James O'Brien on LBC. It is 12.49. I, I should add, actually, before, appropriately enough, we, we, we cross live to Beirut, I should add that, that Jo, as she was leaving, reminded me that she's dedicating all of this year to acts of kindness and reconciliation that the, the idea that you don't confine it just to events or to moments or to indeed to the to the public meeting like the one at St. Jo- to the meeting like the one at St. James's Church in Piccadilly tonight there is a charge for tickets I, I should possibly have mentioned because obviously the um uh, expenses must be met so nothing available online anymore but there will be tickets at the door for that um 10 to 1 is the time I'm going to read you something and then I'm going to introduce you to the person that wrote it. No one said a word, not when the rescue worker slowly picked his way through the glass and twisted metal to reach the back seat of the pickup truck, not when he lifted out the black body bag, and not when he emerged cradling the smashed remains of the one-year-old boy on the way to an ambulance as two Israeli jets roared overhead. The child had been dead for a day by the time the Red Cross worker arrived yesterday, lying face down and unseen in the Chevrolet Silverado after an Israeli airstrike. That was written by Oliver Marsden, who is in Etu in northern Lebanon um, for the Times, or, or was when he wrote that. He joins me now from Lebanon. And I, I, I wanted to share your words, Oliver, because they sort of hit me very very hard and I, I read all the papers every day as you can imagine I know you don't write the headlines and and this one is in quotes anyway but there are rules in war but this is monstrous is the headline under which your article appeared this morning what why um that's a quote from uh, father Esteban Trangia who is the manager of the local hospital uh nearby and that's what he was saying after you know it's now 23 people were killed. He was saying that many of those who survived, they were coming to the hospital with injuries to their faces, to their eyes from the explosion, um, you know, ch- including children. He said five children, I believe. Um, so that was a quote from him. And um, and I think, you know, he he there are many people on the ground who are extremely affected and extremely angry and sad about what is happening here and what happened there. Um, and so, you know, I, I can, um, that is his opinion and, his, and uh, yeah, he makes a good point, I believe. And, and not least because the uh, attack hit a refuge for displaced people, many of whom would have been making their way um, or, or, or fleeing north after, after attacks in the south. And I, I, I always note the presence of this word in some reports like this. It was a predominantly Christian area, which is why, of course, you were talking to a priest. How frustrating is it for you reporting on this region to recognize how little the people that you're writing for know about the region some people will be surprised to learn for example that there is a predominantly christian area in the middle of lebanon yeah i mean lebanon is incredibly complex in that respect you know that it has a confessional power sharing system where the president is always a maronite christian the prime minister is always a sunni muslim and the speaker of parliament is always a shia muslim not not many people know that that no. came out that came off that was came about after the 15 year bloody civil war here and so it's a very complex uh Re- well, region, but it's a very co- complex country, given that there are so many religious, you know, sects within it, and 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 so far, you know, people have been getting along, and they they do have their areas. Some of them are mixed, some of them aren't so mixed, and there has been unity over the years since the civil war, and that is, unfortunately, uh, as Father Esteban also said, uh, it's being tested. He believes it's being pushed on purpose by the Israelis. So you have 
people he said you know he quote that these people these these refugees they're not from the moon they yeah. are from Lebanon. people know each other for example many lebanese have uh, businesses abroad in in west africa there are more lebanese people who live in brazil than live in lebanon there's a huge diaspora and so these people go and work abroad and it doesn't matter what religion they are they they mingle they know each other they come back and so you have people from the shia muslim community fleeing the south being put up in homes in Christian communities like there were like they were um in Aitu and then these homes are being destroyed um and and it is sowing a lot of fear now people are scared to house the displaced from the south and then and on top of that you know their families have been displaced multiple times now they left the south they left they came to the southern suburbs of, suburbs of Beirut those have been hit they're heading further north you know it's almost as far north as you can go away from the fighting and they're still being hit and so that's the, there is many religions here and there are christian areas and there are sunni muslim areas there are shia areas and there are even druze areas um yeah so it's, Still, it's very complex uh, uh, yes I, I thank you for that i think it's important that people understand that background in order to appreciate the level of appreciate the level of